Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you for this wonderful group who we refer to as our spirit family. Thank you for knitting our hearts together. Thank you for making us as one with one another as we are one with you. Thank you, Father, for this community of people who love the Holy Spirit, of people who love your word. And I pray today, Lord, that as your word goes forth, that you would deal with us. I want you to tell him that. Say, Lord, deal with me. Lord, deal with us deeply. Remove those things that ought not to be there. Help us to love. Help us to forgive. Help us to find healing in your presence and in your word and in your truth. We pray this in the unmatched name of Jesus. And I want you to say it because you believe it. Say amen. Okay, getting into the message now. I want to first show you some signs that you may be dealing with bitterness. Now, full disclosure here, these signs that I'm about to give you are not necessarily biblically based specifically. You will find them in principle backed by scripture. But what I'm about to show you, signs to help you identify the bitterness in your own heart, these things are actually found in people who are bitter. And I know this from seeing bitterness work in the hearts of people who I love and know. So this comes from experience, things I've observed about people who deal with bitterness. So take a listen here. I'm going to give you this list. I'm going to show you some ways you can identify bitterness in your own heart. And as you do, prayerfully listen to this. Ask the Lord to reveal to you how you might be dealing with bitterness or unforgiveness, because sometimes we, we tuck things away deep within our heart. And we pretend that it's not there and we hope that God doesn't see it, but God sees everything. Okay, so the first sign here, and maybe, Steve, you've seen some of these too. And if you can think of any, Steve, feel, feel free to throw those in. And you, you in the chat, it. if you can think of any, uh, feel free to throw in other signs too. Okay, here's a sign that you may be dealing with bitterness. Number one, you're highly judgmental, cynical, critical. No one can do anything right. You attend church and all you do is nitpick at all of those things that you don't like. The lights are too bright. The music is too loud. The sermon is too short. The sermon is too long. The pastor didn't talk enough about this. Or the pastor talked too much about that. The people took my seat. I don't like the way they greeted me. I don't like the color of the building. I don't like the way that pastors dress. All of these things come usually from a bitter heart. Number two, you're very defensive. Whenever the topic of bitterness and unforgiveness comes up, we like to throw out our exceptions. It's interesting to me how personal people take my public comments sometimes. So sometimes I'll put something out there. For example, I'll publicly say, we need to release people from unforgiveness. And rather than just letting it be or saying amen, people who are bitter will actually comment, well, hold on, wait a minute. You don't know my story. What if da, 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 da. Or what if I went through this, 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 and this? Or you didn't know what type of relationship I was in. Or you didn't know my story. And they will take it so personal, even though it's a public comment, really not addressed to anyone in particular, they'll take it right to heart and immediately begin to defend their bitterness and thus reveal their bitterness. So people who are bitter are very defensive. Another sign that you may be bitter is that you replay the hurt in your mind again and again and again, and you allow it to anger you. You allow it to upset your emotions and stir your mind again over and over and over again. You replay the memory of the hurt. Another sign that you may be dealing with bitterness is that you constantly feel this compulsion to retell the story of how you were hurt. Now, it's one thing to go to someone who you love and trust, who is a close friend or family member, maybe a spiritual brother or sister, and you go to them and you explain to them how you were hurt, you tell them the story, they pray with you, you open up to them. That's one thing. It's another thing entirely to live your whole life with this deep compulsion to where you feel this need to constantly retell the story of how you were hurt, to constantly tell everyone how difficult you have it. Every single conversation, you look for a way to work it in. Every time there's people gathering and fellowshipping, you try to steer the discussion to the point where you'll be able to share with everybody just how hurt you are. Another sign that you may be dealing with bitterness is that you have this need or you think you need people to side with you so that they see your enemy in the same light that you do. In other words, I'm angry at this person. I don't like this person. And therefore, I'm going to try to get everyone else to see this person the way I see them. 
So you may see someone as being really mean or really impatient, or you may not like the way that someone operates. So rather than just let that be, if you deal with bitterness, you have to rally others around you. You have to get others to agree with you, look at that person, and likewise say, oh yeah, that person is mean, or that person is that, or I agree with you, that person could use some work in this area in their character. The reality is, is we all could use work on our character. We all could be more like Jesus in one way or another. Mm -hmm. But when you're bitter, you want everyone to agree with you about that person, Mm. about that church, about that pastor, about that denomination, about that group of people, about that family. We want people to see from our perspective because really in getting others to see people from our perspective, we feel vindicated and we get a false sense of justice. We get satisfaction in knowing that others likewise are saying, oh, you know what? I agree with you. I see that too. But really what's actually happening in most cases is A, the person probably doesn't actually agree with you. They probably are just saying that so you stop telling them the story again and again and again. And B, it's also possible that you're simply polluting their minds against the people who you hate, against the people who you hold anger toward. And it's possible that they never would have come to that conclusion had it not been for your slander. So people who are bitter have this need or they think they have a need for people to side with them so that those people see their enemy in the same light that they do. You know you're possibly suffering from bitterness if you find it difficult to trust people. Now, mm. this, one's, this one's a bit explosive because people in general don't trust people. But I dare say that many people, without even realizing it, are dealing with the consequences of hurt, are dealing with the consequences of a certain pain that they didn't even realize they were carrying. Mm. In other words, someone offended them, someone hurt them, someone did something to them, someone didn't do something that they were supposed to do. They spoke a word that maybe found a root or found a place to have root in their heart. And so those words spoken, those actions taken or not taken, whatever it may have been, whatever the circumstance, now the person has this bitterness and they find it difficult to trust other people. Mm, come on. I'm amazed at how many believers make the excuses for why they're not in church. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed at how many believers make excuses for why they don't attend a fellowship of believers. I love our gatherings. This is a wonderful community. If you ask me, this is the best community online. And I say that, of course, I'm a little bit biased because I love you so much, but I believe that. I believe there's no other community like ours, biblically grounded, spirit filled power, substance, the presence of the Holy Spirit. I believe God is in this community. But this can't replace your church attendance. Wow. This can't replace the personal in-person gathering of the saints. I'm amazed at how many believers make up excuses for why they're not in church. And they throw out all these things, well, I can't find one. Or there, there's, too much, there's too many problems with the one I was going to. Or, and they nitpick all the while not realizing that they're actually not in church because they were hurt at the last place they went. And now they're on such heavy guard that there's no way they're going to step foot into another church. Another issue that arises from bitterness, and this is another sign that you may be dealing with bitterness, is the offender can do no right. I find it amazing how many people let the first impression dominate themselves for the rest of their lives. So they'll allow their first impression or a bad impression of an individual to dominate their thoughts about that person for the rest of their lives. This is a sign that someone is deeply, deeply hurt. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some insight right now. Hear me now. When somebody makes up their mind about people on first impressions alone, and it's easy to get on their bad side, that individual has some hurt that needs to be healed. That individual is very, very broken. In other words, everything's fine. They say one thing and now they kind of like mark them in their mind. Okay, I don't like that one. They tell their friends, we don't like that one. They tell their spouse, we don't like that one. They tell their children, we don't like that one. They tell their Bible study group, oh, we don't like that one. Why? Because one issue happened, one comment, one little interaction they didn't like, And suddenly now they're against them. Their mind has changed about that person and they want everybody to have that same mindset about that person. That is, not only is that manipulation, that's a sign of brokenness. That's a sign of hurt. 
to where now this person can do no right in your eyes. No matter how kind they are to you. No matter how many times they apologize to you. No matter how many times they try to make things right. Doesn't matter. You did that one thing. So I'm going to put you in my, my jail. It's like an offense jail. You offend me, I put you in that little jail and you live there the rest of your life. And no matter what you do, you're always in that jail. And that is a sign of bitterness. A more obvious sign of bitterness is that you wish calamity upon your offender. You hope something bad happens to them. You hope they face their consequences, as some might put it. Today, a lot of what we call justice is actually just revenge. Wow. I thank God he wow, doesn't wow, give wow. us justice. You realize that if God gave everybody justice, we'd all be in hell? Mm. Let me say that again. I thank God he doesn't give us all justice. If God gave us all justice, we'd all be in hell. I thank God that he instead gave us mercy. Mm -hmm. So again, just to recap, again, these are not biblical necessarily. You're not going to find these in chapter and in verse. You'll find them in biblical principles and in everyday experience. But this is just a small introduction. So ways to identify bitterness in your heart, highly judgmental, very defensive. You replay the hurt. You retell the story. You need people to side with you and see your so-called enemy in the same light that you do. You find it difficult to trust people. The offender can do no right. You put them in that little prison. You marked them. They're the one that I don't like. And you tell everyone around you, we don't like that one. You try to push them out of your life in a very negative way. That is a sign of offense. You wish calamity upon the offender. That's an even deeper form of offense. And many people actually even allow their hearts to get to that place to where they're wishing calamity upon their offender. Uh, Paula Chavez says, yes, amen. Gloria Chang says, wow. I see. Uh, Carol says, I don't even want justice. That's a mm. great place to stand. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments coming in. How many of you so far are being challenged by this? If you're being challenged, just type the word amen. Okay, some things you should know about bitterness. Bitterness, number one, is a root. Bitterness is a root. Hebrews 12, 15 says, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Do you realize that the Bible describes bitterness as a root? Roots are the growth system of something. So bitterness is not just trouble in and of itself. Bitterness is the root system for all sorts of evil and calamity in your heart and in your life. Bitterness is itself a growth system. Mm. Bitterness produces things. Bitterness causes things. Bitterness has symptoms deadly, spiritually lethal symptoms. Even the Bible talks about bitterness corrupting the body, causing the bones to waste away, causing aches and pains. Bitterness is a troublesome root. Other things come out of it. When you allow bitterness to take hold of your heart, when you allow bitterness a place to grow, even just through a little offense, then what begins to sprout up in your life are signs of the flesh. Your flesh begins to gain control. Your flesh gains an advantage over you mm -hmm. because you've allowed bitterness to take root in your heart. So this is very deceptive of the enemy. And the way bitterness works is, is very, very subtle sometimes. I mean, it can be something so, so, so simple. Maybe you run into someone who's very, very tired that day. And they say something that just doesn't sit right with you. Or maybe they greet you in a very cold manner. That's an open door for bitterness. Maybe somebody says that someone said something about you. So it's not exactly you hearing it from them, but you're hearing it from someone who heard it from someone who heard it from them. And by the time it reaches you, it's been so distorted as to not even be true. Yet you embrace it. You accept it. You believe it. For what? Just because you heard it. That's an open door for bitterness. Say someone makes a commitment to you and doesn't keep that commitment. That's an open door for bitterness. Let's say you place expectations on someone. You expect something from someone at a certain time, at a certain place, at a certain event, and those expectations just aren't met. That's an open door for bitterness. Or your pastor says something you don't like. Or a YouTuber says something you don't agree with. Mm. Or a worship team 
doesn't allow you to be on it. Ooh. Or maybe someone in the workplace, they get a promotion and you don't. Mm -mm -mm. Someone gets blessed with something you've been praying for for a long time. And they come right in and they take that blessing. So it seems that's an open door for bitterness in big ways and in little ways. There are open doors to bitterness in our hearts. And we must guard our hearts lest that root of bitterness begin to take hold in us. Number two, bitterness and anger are partners. Mm. This is key here. Ephesians 4.31, and in just a moment, later on, in the, I should say uh, in a few minutes later on in this message, I'm going to show you how to prevent bitterness in the first place, how to get rid of bitterness, and I'm going to show you from the Scripture how to never be offended in the first place. That's even a better place to live. But let's go back to number two here. Bitterness and anger are partners. Ephesians 4.31 and get rid of all bitterness. Now remember, bitterness is the root. Look what sprouts up as a result of bitterness. Watch this. This is so powerful what the scripture gives us insight on. Get rid of all bitterness. What sprouts up? Rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Do you realize that when you're bitter, there's a quiet anger to your mood? When you walk into a room, you just fill the air with this discomfort that people can sense. When you're bitter, even sometimes you make jokes. Hear me now. Even sometimes you make jokes. They're actually criticisms and insults, and you try to describe them as jokes, and they're really hidden, subtle jabs that you put in there. Those are harsh words. You try to hurt the person, but you don't want to look like the bad guy, so you make it look like you're joking, and you stab at their heart. And you strike them with your harsh words. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. Oh, that's a big one. Slander is an expression of anger. Slander is an expression of anger. When I carry bitterness towards someone in my heart, my mouth will produce slander toward that person. You want to know who you're bitter against? Who are you talking bad about? Who are you talking bad about? Whoever you talk bad about, you're bitter against. Bitterness produces rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, all types of evil behavior. Number three, bitterness pollutes your spiritual life. James 3, 7 through 11 says this, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes, I love this contrast, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. So Sunday morning, you could be worshiping, praising God, and before you leave that church building, you've already said words about somebody who was created in the image of God because of the bitterness in your heart. Verse 10, and so blessing and cursing, Come pouring out of the mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, mm. that is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Bitterness begins to pollute your spiritual life and it begins to disrupt your development in Christ-like character. Bitterness wants to hang on to the offense. Why? Because it's seeking revenge and calling it justice. Wow. Bitterness doesn't want to believe anything good about the person who offended them. Bitterness sees everything as a negative. Now, there was such a thing called, um, what was it, uh, AR technology, Steve? Right. Were, mm -hmm. you, at, were, you, did I, was that, were you the one I was showing that to? Yeah. The, the, um, it was like, a, uh, like a, an app that, can you explain it? It's hard for me to explain. So as far as like the... Like the a AR technology, how it projects on things. Yeah, yeah. So what we were talking about, the I believe it was maybe a few weeks ago or maybe a week ago, um, he was talking about AR technology and how that you can put something on and become... Uh, it, the whole world can change. Obviously, it's like virtual reality almost. And it could be done like through the phone, can't Yeah, it, it could be done through the phone. You take a photo and it could you can see a T-Rex or something on the other side. That was the not app. there. That was the app. We, so like we, we were in Pompeii, right? Right. I think that's where we first started using it. And, and I <laughs> yeah. took like my camera out 
And I was able to project through my lens on camera this T-Rex come, come out onto the actual field that we were mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever seen AR technology, it's called, it's, it's augmented reality. In other words, it projects a certain digital reality overlaid on the actual real world. And so this, there's a lot of promise in this technology as far as applications of entertainment and so forth, even in the medical field. But I thought, what a great example that is of how bitterness works. Mm. You see, when we're bitter against someone, it's like we have that augmented reality placed upon actual reality. So we hold the bitterness in our hearts and the bitterness in our hearts begins to produce this image and overlay it on people, not just on the people we're bitter against, but it begins to also overlay that reality on everyone and everything else. And it even comes back on your own image of yourself. It even comes back to hurt how you see yourself. So bitterness sees everything through that filter, that negative filter. Um, the bitterness causes you to want that individual to feel guilty. You don't want them to enjoy their life. You don't want them to be able to move on. You don't want them to be blessed. You, don't, you may not even want them to be saved. That's how far bitterness can go sometimes to where now you're hoping that everything that they enjoy is taken from them. You're hoping that the full wrath of God comes upon them. You're hoping that they're punished. You're hoping that they're stripped of all blessings. You're hoping that they never get a promotion, that they never have a happy marriage. You're hoping that their mm. children fail in everything that they mm -hmm, do. You're hoping mm -hmm, they never mm -hmm. have financial increase, so on and so forth. Why? Because of this negative way of seeing mm. the people against whom we hold bitterness and life itself. It causes you to want to play shame. Think about that. Now, how, how, how familiar does that sound? Because the Bible calls someone the accuser, and it's not Jesus. Do you know who the accuser is in Scripture? The accuser is the enemy. It's the devil. And when you accuse you're taking on the nature of Satan. This wow. is heavy stuff. You guys need to hear this. The Bible makes it very clear that the enemy, the devil, is the accuser. Bitterness turns you into an accuser rather than an advocate. Bitterness causes you to want people to experience shame rather than forgiveness. Even what good they do is twisted by bitterness. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of truth here in this phrase, and I want you to actually remember this phrase if you can. It's not your experience, but how you interpret your experience that most often leads to bitterness. I'm going to say it again. It's not your experience, but how you interpret your experience that most often leads to bitterness. One more time. It's not your experience, but how you interpret your experience that most often leads to bitterness. Now, of course, there are those things that people do to us that cause us to be hurt and offended, and they're obvious things, like there, there, there's sexual um, assault, there's molestation, there's murder, there's a physical abuse, there's emotional abuse, there is, there is such a thing as harsh words. People speak them against you, and they intentionally try to tear you down. Now, these things, of course, are going to offend you. These things, of course, are very real problems that can break someone down. And so I'm not saying those don't exist. But more often than not, this is true. It's not your experience, but how you interpret your experience mm. that most often leads to bitterness. So it's not necessarily that the person is trying to hurt you. It's not necessarily that the person has evil intentions towards you, and it's not even necessarily that you're seeing things the way that they actually are. Rather, it's that because of the hurt of the past, you're now seeing everything through that lens. So no matter who does what, your mind is always going to search for the negative way or the negative way it could be interpreted, and that's what you live in, and that becomes your augmented reality. Wow, wow, wow. Your, your projected reality overlaid on actual reality. That's how bitterness pollutes your spiritual life. And it's, in fact, so deadly that it begins to pollute the way you see God. You start to think God is against you. You start to see yourself as a victim. Hear me now. You start to see yourself as a victim. Nothing I ever do amounts to anything. God never does it for me. Why haven't I received my miracle yet? Well, I've been praying and nothing good ever happens or comes my way. That is a result of hurt and hurt produces bitterness. Bitterness produces this negative way 
of seeing things. Very important, number four. So, so far we have number one, bitterness is a root. In other words, it produces things in your life. Number two, bitterness and anger are partners. Number three, bitterness pollutes your spiritual life. Number four, please hear me now, this is so key. Bitterness disrupts your friendships. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's so much truth here. Let me read that again because listen to what the scripture is saying. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Do you know what a good marriage is? A good marriage is the union between two really good forgivers. One of the things I'm thankful for is that I married a woman who has the gift of forgiveness. If it's a spiritual gift, she's got it, I promise you. And one of the things Jess and I have really worked on in our marriage is to make sure that we're not keeping a list or a record of wrongs. So you notice the Bible says, love prospers when a fault is forgiven. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Love keeps no record of wrong, or love keeps no list of having been wronged. Some people, they treat their relationships in a way that they keep a list. Mm. You did this, I'm putting it down. You did more good things this week than you did bad things for me, so I'm going to balance it out, and you're still my friend. Mm -hmm. And that is not the way to approach it. Do you realize everyone will let you down at some point? Just the reality. Your spouse will let you down. Your parents will let you down. Your children will let you down. Your friends will let you down. And get this, you're going to let people down too. Now you may say, oh no, I'm always there for others. I'm always there for others. Well, I promise you that if you were to ask everyone around you, you'd eventually find something that you did and maybe you didn't even realize you did that offended someone else. So we're all going to offend someone and we're all going to be offended. But love prospers when a fault is forgiven. Dwelling on it separates close friends. You ever do that where somebody says something and instead of just letting it go, you let it simmer in your mind. You pace back and forth. Maybe you write something on Facebook, tempted to put it out there and kind of hint at them. Isn't it funny when people do this? Or you start to allow that bitterness to warp the way you see the mm. individual. Well, I, now I see your true colors. I always found that interesting. You could have a decade-long friendship. You could have friends for years and years and years or a happy marriage for years and years and years. And then when bitterness starts to set in, suddenly you start to say things like, well, now I see your true colors. Or maybe you go to a church for several years and they've done well. Things are going good. The worship mm -hmm, is great. Mm -hmm. The pastor preaches wonderful sermons. The fellowship is like family getting together and you're enjoying your new church family. And then all of a sudden one thing happens and you say, ah, well, that was a bad church anyway. Oh, now I see their true colors. I see how they really are. They show me the actual way that they are. And in thinking like this, what you're actually doing is destroying valuable relationships because you're expecting perfection out of people instead of giving them grace. And so the Bible says dwelling on it separates close friends. When you dwell on a thing, when you focus your mind on that thing, when you, when you choose to not let that go, you're holding it. And in holding it, it begins to eat away at you instead of just releasing them from it. Stop keeping lists of ways that people have hurt you. Stop keeping score on your friends, on your spouse, on your family. Stop holding things against people and instead release them. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. You want to know why you have to jump from friendship to friendship and you have no friendships that last for several years? And I'm not saying this is everybody, but certainly this is someone watching. Somebody watching this has trouble keeping close friends. Somebody watching this has issues with staying planted in the church. Somebody watching this has issues with every pastor they've ever loved. Some of you might be offended at what I'm saying today and say, well, I'm not listening to David Deger Hernandez anymore. Why? Because bitterness. And you watch this pattern in your life where you begin to trust people again. You befriend them, you connect with them, and then you set all of these expectations really, really high in a way of protecting yourself so that when they violate those impossible expectations, now you're free to release them. And you realize that's a self-defense mechanism? That looking for perfection in people is a self-defense mechanism? That you're waiting for the one flaw so that you can get out of there? 
Why? Because you don't want to get too close to be hurt. People will hurt you. That's just a fact of life. But when you live according to the Spirit, instead of letting that bitterness tear apart your friendships, you choose instead to love them. You choose instead to bring them closer through the act of forgiveness. Steve, how's the chat doing? Oh, the chat is on fire. My goodness, there, there are so many comments I'm trying to keep up with. Um, they're all agreeing, saying amen. There's fire emojis going left and right. There's hundred emojis going left and right. Um, people are receiving. I think this is such a deep, deep topic that is just perfect for, for today and perfect for them right now because they're all agreeing and they, they, they see it. I mean, my well, goodness. that's beautiful to know that people are responding to the message. I'm seeing a bunch of amens. Uh, James George, bitterness adds to the trust deficit. Yes, that's a very, very good point, George. Uh, James George, I appreciate that. Um, Atoya says, I self-sabotage. I'm learning to love. Yeah, guys, these are, these are issues of the heart. And I'm so glad that you're open to the word of God because we're going to take care of this today. You're going to be free. Let me tell you something. You can be free from this. I want to I talk to you first about how bitterness can disrupt your relationship with God. And then I'm going to show you what the scripture says about how to cure bitterness. So, so far we see that bitterness is a root, that bitterness and anger are partners, that bitterness pollutes your spiritual life, that bitterness disrupts your friendships. Number five, bitterness disrupts your relationship with God. Watch this, Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. I like to say that forgiveness is a river. It has to be flowing to be working. If you're receiving God's forgiveness, but never releasing it, the waters become stagnant. And if you're never receiving God's forgiveness, then there's nothing to release to others. You have to both receive God's forgiveness and release God's forgiveness in order to benefit from the river of forgiveness. Some of us wait for the perfect apology from someone. We have it set up in our minds like a movie. Maybe it's going to be raining and they're going to knock on the door and they're going to say, can I come in and talk? I need to tell you something. You know, I realize that after all these years, me saying this or me doing this or me not saying this or me not saying that really hurt you. And I want you to know I'm so sorry. And I want you to know that from now on, things are going to be different. And then you're going to magically see a change in me. That's what some of us actually picture that they're going to feel the pain of what they've done to us, that they're going to finally release us from this prison of the hurt that they've caused and the offense that they created in our hearts. And we're waiting for that day. We're waiting for them to go over the list in our heads and apologize for each item on that list. We're waiting for the reconnection. We're waiting for them to reach out. We're waiting for them to offer an apology that would make any Hollywood movie great. You want to know the reality? Most people probably don't even know they offended you. Most people probably don't even know you're angry with them. Most people probably have no clue that you have something in your heart towards them. But I'll tell you who does know, your heavenly father. But when you are praying first, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your father in heaven will forgive your sins too. You guys, it disrupts your prayer life. It disrupts the flow of God's forgiveness in your life. Stop waiting for the perfect apology and instead choose to be a perfect forgiver. I'm going to say that again. Stop waiting for the perfect apology and instead choose to be the perfect forgiver. And that's not easy to do. And that's easier definitely said than done. But that's not to say that this isn't possible. You can be released from this prison that you've allowed to hold you. So I want to talk to you about this cure for bitterness. How do you get rid of bitterness? Again, I want to emphasize this before I, I read the scripture here. It's very simple. Getting rid of unforgiveness and bitterness is very, very, very simple. But just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy. For example, staying on budget is simple. Make sure that your outgo doesn't exceed your income. Simple, but not easy. Want to stay healthy? Very simple. Eat the right food, get plenty of sleep, and exercise regularly. Simple, but definitely not easy. You want to be spiritually fit? 
Read the word every day, morning and night if you can. Be in prayer every day. Live holy, simple, but not necessarily easy. In the same way, forgiving people is so, 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 so simple, but not at all easy. Because to forgive someone is to release them from the punishment that you want to come upon them. To forgive someone is to release them from ever giving you that apology that you wanted. That's difficult. Because we want that apology. In some cases, we want them to be punished. That's why I said what I said at the top of the broadcast, that often what we call justice today isn't justice, it's revenge. And I'm thankful that God didn't give us all justice, because if he gave us all justice, we'd all be in hell. Thank God he gave us grace, not justice. Ephesians 4.32 says, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I like to say, forgive faster than they can apologize. Don't wait for the apology. Forgive faster than they can apologize. So instead, be kind to each other. What does that mean? It means what it means. Treat each other with kindness. Tender-hearted. That means you're inclined to be tender toward them. You're inclined to show them kindness. You're inclined to be gentle toward them. You know, sometimes we have this list in our heads of people who we like and people who we dislike. Those are the ones I like. Those are the ones I dislike. The people we like, oh, we treat them with such kindness and tenderness. The people we dislike, oh, those are the ones I'm a little harsh with. I'm a little short with. Bible says, instead, be kind to each other. That's every believer. Tender-hearted. I'm inclined to be kind to you. Forgiving one another. Now, here's the real challenge. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How has God done it? He chose to do it. He suffered to forgive you. Really think about that. Jesus literally suffered to forgive you. Sometimes in order to forgive, you have to pick up your cross. There is a part in suffering when you forgive. There is a part of you that will suffer when you release someone. Sometimes there is suffering in forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes people do know what they're doing to us. But that doesn't mean we don't release them. Matthew 18, 21 to 22, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Verse 22. Hmm. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven, why? What does that mean? That means if somebody sins against you seven times, you forgive them even more. 70 times seven. That means you forgive them multiple times for each offense. You forgive them multiple times for each offense. Do you realize that it's not always the offense that causes us to be hurt? Because sometimes we get hurt, the person offends us, we forgive them, we move on, and then the memory of what they did to us re-offends us. This is so deep because many of us miss this truth. This is why Jesus talked about multiple points of forgiveness when someone offends you. Because sometimes you forgive them not for what they did, but for the memory of what they did. 70 times 7. Sometimes the memory will re-offend you. And I think we mistake the memory of offense for suffering with unforgiveness because we say, well, I did forgive them. How come it keeps popping back up again? Because the memory is still there. And you're going to have to choose every day to forgive them for what they did, for what they didn't do, for what they said, for failing to meet your expectations. Whatever it was, you have to forgive them. There are no exceptions to this. Hear me now, please. There are no exceptions. Forgiving just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How has God forgiven us? He's forgiven us completely. There's nothing we've done that he won't forgive. You must be the same way. You say, but, but, but they did this. But, but, but this was so horrible. But, but you don't know that. Does it matter? And I know that may sound insensitive. That's not my goal. But it truly doesn't matter. Anything that anyone could have done to us 
doesn't even come close to comparing to what we've done to God, to what we did to Jesus. Culture today will tell you, they'll actually attack me for saying that. David, you shouldn't say that. You don't know what people have gone through. But I'm not trying to be culturally correct. I'm trying to be biblically correct. You realize when we got saved, we became dead. How can you offend a dead man? How can a dead woman hold a fence? You can't. We must forgive no matter what it was. There are no, you are not the exception to that rule. What they did to you is not the exception. I'm, I know this is harsh, but some of us need to hear this because we've excused our unforgiveness thinking that because what they did to us was so bad that somehow we're released from this command. No, no matter what they did, you need to forgive them, period, period. And that's very clear in the scripture. Now, having said that, you must understand that forgiveness is a choice, not an emotion, because the memory will reoffend you. Every day you may remember it several times throughout the day, and you have to choose to, instead of dwelling on it, instead of holding on to it, instead of hoping that they pay, instead of speaking evil against them, instead of seeking revenge, you just choose to, Lord, I release this to you. And sometimes it's as simple as that prayer. You may still feel from it. You may still have some hurt from it, but in choosing to respond to the issue instead of just letting it fester within you, you avoid the bondage of bitterness. And I thank God that he's given us a way out, which is his grace. Let God forgive them through you. Let God mm. forgive them through Come you. Come on. Release those individuals. Release those people. Let God forgive them through you. Forgive faster than they can apologize. We must choose Man. to do this. And I want to really hammer this point in because, again, that memory will keep coming up. And you may have to choose every time that memory pops up to choose to forgive them again. And then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And guess what? As time goes on, though it's always simple, as time goes on, it will get easier and easier and easier and easier. Like a spiritual muscle you're exercising, lifting that weight, becomes easier and easier. Listen to this. This is something I wrote, I believe, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not to say it's equivalent of Scripture or anything like that, but I believe the Holy Spirit pressed these truths on my heart. Bitterness seeks revenge. Forgiveness seeks reconciliation. Bitterness lives in the past. Forgiveness frees you to dream about the future. Bitterness says, because they owe me. Forgiveness says, because I owe God. Wow, wow, wow. Bitterness pushes guilt. Forgiveness lifts burdens. Bitterness seeks to prove a point. Forgiveness lets it go. Bitterness accuses. Forgiveness covers. In a moment, I want to tell you how to prevent bitterness and what to do when others are bitter with you. But first, Steve, I want to check in with the chat. Yeah, so the chat is uh, completely agreeing. And I just told the chat right now, if you guys want to write these down and share it later on your Instagram feed or Twitter, whatever you want, these are some really, really amazing quotes. So continue to like, share, and comment. And like I said, the chat is so fast, I can't even keep up with you guys. You guys are amazing. So we also have, I want to say a few things too. I like this comment here. Uh, take take your happiness. Stop it in your tracks. Forgiveness. Oh, I can't even read. Forgiveness lets it go. Forgiveness covers. Man, you guys are on fire. I see so I, many I, people. I'm watching writing. the comments, and I'm wondering how you're even keeping up. They, with this. They are flying by. <laughs> They're going by so quickly. The quick chat there. is going crazy right now. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, keep the comments coming. And if you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe to us because we constantly really, I'm not done with the message. I'm going to tell you how to, how to prevent bitterness in the first place and what to do when others are bitter with you. But make sure you're subscribed. We constantly release new content on the Holy Spirit, prayer, spiritual warfare. I think we're at now 325,000 subscribers. We're going for a million. So join the Spirit family. Subscribe today. Click that notification bell when you do. And make sure that you click it for all notifications so that you can be notified when we release new content. And also, you'll be a part of these wonderful live streams. Again, we call them affectionately our spirit family. No community like you guys. We so appreciate you. So I'm going to go now into the Word again. And let me, let me actually check out where you guys are. Um, you guys are now at 400 
and 88 likes on this video. If you get to 1,000 likes, and make sure they like them, guys, anybody joining us, if you get to 1,000 likes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you real quick these. I'm going to send you Carriers of the Glory, the English version, as well as the Chinese version. Even if you don't read Chinese, it's a nice gift to have, and you'll actually receive the first ever signed copy of the Chinese version. I'll even write that in there that it's the first signed copy. And uh, that we're going to give away to someone in the chat if you reach 1,000 likes. So let's get that going. If, and you have to reach 1,000 likes before we go off the air. Otherwise, it doesn't, uh, well, it counts, but it doesn't count toward the giveaway. Love you guys. Okay, how to prevent bitterness in the first place. I'm going to show you something from the scripture here. Colossians 3.13 says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. What does that mean to make allowance for each other's faults? Well, I look at it like budgeting. Financially speaking, if you want to keep your finances stable, you have to budget for every single dollar. Now, every month at the beginning of the month, I know exactly what my expenses will be, down to even what exactly we're going to use for spending, exactly how much we're putting in savings. I keep track of all the bills. I know what bills come out on what dates and down to the penny what those bills will cost. If I don't know, I overestimate so that we save when they hit instead of and losing when those bills hit. And what I actually like to do is I leave a little bit of a cushion. I leave an allowance. Just in case something goes a little over, there's enough money to cover it. So if the cable bill is $99, then I make sure to budget $125. If I think I'm going to spend $200 on gas for the week or the month, then I'll put $250, $300 as a budget for the gas for the month. If I think that we're going to spend X amount of dollars on groceries, I'll usually add 20, 30% to that and so forth and so on. So in doing that, I'm making allowance for any trouble that I may run into in the future. In the same way, we must with each other make allowance for each other's faults. Let me just clue you in on a heavy revelation here from the Holy Spirit. Your friends are going to offend you. Your church family is going to offend you. I am going to offend you. Your pastor is going to offend you. Your parents will offend you. Your children, especially in their teen years, will offend you. My staff and I are going to offend each other. Just a fact of life. The question is, what will you do when the offense comes? What will you do when the hurt comes? Are you going to hold it against them or are you going to have already made allowance? Now, I want to say this to you. Please remember this. Forgiveness is not something necessarily that I do after I've been hurt. Forgiveness is the state of my heart before the offense ever comes. I want to say that again. Forgiveness is not something that I do after I've been hurt. Forgiveness is the state of my heart before the offense ever comes. Forgive, to give before. To give before it occurs. Forgive. Now, I don't mean that you should... There's somebody watching me right now. You're carrying these things and you've been carrying them for a long time. And you know, when, 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 you, when you get an injury on, on your hand or wherever, I, I the other day got, got a little cut. It was a small, tiny cut that I didn't even know I had. I didn't know I had it till somebody gave me hand sanitizer and then it started burning. And I look, I go, oh my goodness, the, the cut is so small, but it stings so bad. Hmm. Somebody gave me hand sanitizer. I said, here, put this on. And I put it on real quick. And then my, 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 it was my thumb, it started burning. And I look and I could see this tiny little cut that I didn't even realize was there. Do you realize that most injuries, spiritually speaking, don't really even hurt that bad until you try to clean them? Mm, come on. It's when you try to clean the wound that the pain comes. 
So some of us, we've been hurt. We carry this deep offense within our hearts. And we don't want anybody to touch that area. And so in order to receive that healing, we have to allow somebody to come. We have to allow the Lord to touch that area. That's why whenever you hear messages on forgiveness, you just excuse it. You say, well, you don't know what happened to me. Or, well, that's easy for you to say. Or, well, you don't know the story. That's bitterness talking. That's defense because you don't want to open up that wound to the Lord. It's never going to come for you until you choose to let it go. That's the, that's the sad reality. This is why most people who struggle with this for so many years aren't free. It's not because the sermon didn't give them the information. It's not because the prayer didn't work. It's not because the Holy Spirit doesn't have the power. It's because they choose to hang on to what God wants them to let go of. And so I challenge you today. It's time to let go of the hurt. No more excuses. No more saying, well, well, well if I try, I might not be able to do it, so I'm just going to hang on to it. Or, oh, I've prayed this prayer before, so I'm just not going to do it. Or, you don't know what they did to me, so I'm just not going to do it. No. Today's the day. I love you enough to tell you the truth. It's time to let it go. It's time to stop living in that memory. Hasn't it taken your joy for long enough? Mm, come on. Hasn't it robbed you of relationships long enough? Hasn't it disrupted your prayer life long enough? Hasn't it kept you out of church long enough? It's time. God loves you. Please hear me. God loves you too much to leave you in that pain, to leave you in that loneliness. God loves you too much to keep you in that place. He's calling you now. I know it's hard. And I know you've kept these things closed off for so many years. And I know you've gripped them tightly, not wanting to ever be hurt again. But it's time to give it to Jesus. Mom. It's time to place it in his hand. It's time to let him fix you up, to heal you. Healing begins at forgiveness. See, we think that, that we're going to be healed and then we'll forgive. No, 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 no. Healing begins after forgiveness. It's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. I'm going to pray with you and then I'm going to show you what to do if others are bitter with you. Father, I thank you for releasing us from all bitterness, from every root of hurt and offense. Help us to forgive. I want you to release it to him now. That's the power of God some of you are sensing. That's the power of God. I want you to even, as a public confession, type it in the comments I release it. Just write that in the comments. I release it. Those three words. I release it. And whatever it is, whoever it is, give it to Jesus. Father, I thank you that you're healing all hearts. Father, I thank you that you're uprooting bitterness. We honor and we bless your name. Let him have it. Let him take it. And Holy Spirit, I pray you begin to heal. Heal those who are walking in offense. Heal those who are wounded, I pray. In the name of Jesus. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Well, guys, amen. I'm going to teach a little more here. And then, we'll, then I'm sure we'll get into the, the Q&A portion of this message. What to do if others are bitter with you? This is a big one. Matthew 5, 23 through 24 says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Again, that's Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Notice the scripture here says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, this doesn't say you remember you have something against someone else. This scripture says you remember that someone has something against you. That means you hold some responsibility if you've offended someone. Now, I understand that some people are 
difficult. They're a little immature. They look for every little thing to be offended. You don't have to constantly appease that. But the scripture does say in Romans 12, 18, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. My philosophy is this, and I think it's biblical. My philosophy is that that little irritation with people's nitpickiness is worth relationship. For me, I would rather jump through a few hoops with difficult people than to sever a relationship that I know God put together. I'd rather deal with a difficult person, and sometimes it's the most difficult people who end up being your best friends because you, 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 you opened something in them. You were there for them. You, you, you helped them come out of that prison. And sometimes people do have these prisons up and this difficulty around them. It's their way of wanting to protect themselves. They like to be unlikable because it protects them from other people. But if you can somehow get beyond that, well, you've won a brother, you've won a sister. So the Bible does say it's on you to go to them, go to them, you go to them. Not wait for them to come to you and tell them that you're, say, hey, I'm offended with you. Don't do that. You go to the person and you say, hey, I think I offended you. I'm sorry. I always make it a point to apologize. And I think we should make that as Christians, our philosophy. Don't just shrug your shoulders and go, mm, I don't know if they got hurt. Well, maybe they were offended. Oh, maybe they seemed a little bothered at that. No, no, no. Don't just shrug that off. That's not what Jesus would do. You go to your brother, you go to your sister and you say, hey, did I offend you? And you know, when you do that, your apology seems much more sincere than when they confront you. Mm. See, when they confront you and say, this is how you've hurt me, they might think you're just apologizing because you want to get them off your back. But when you go to them and you seek out reconciliation, they think to themselves, wow, here's someone who actually cares about me. In what ways are you hurting people? In what ways are you mistreating people? There are, are so many things that we do that could possibly offend people. And I'm not saying live in this hyper paranoid state, constantly wondering, did I hurt you? Did I hurt you? Did I hurt you? Did I hurt you? No, I'm simply saying, be aware of other people. Be aware of how what you do offends them. Now, there's a balance to this because it's not possible for you to make them forgive you. You may go and apologize to someone and they don't hold, you know, they, they hold it in their heart. They never let it go. I had this issue. I won't say any, I never say any names or anything like that. So there was this pastor who just made it. I mean, he was a very difficult person to deal with, like constantly looking for ways to argue with me, constantly looking for ways to have confrontation. And it was very, I gave this guy a lot of grace, like over the years, again, and again, and again. And it would seem that every time I apologized, that one apology would branch out into 10 things. Well, now here's the 10 things I want you to apologize for. And each apology just opened the door for demands for more apologies. And, you know, I, I did everything I could. Like I said, I gave this person a lot of grace. I apologized several times, even when I wasn't in the wrong. I did everything I could to save that relationship. I can say honest before God, I did everything I could. But at some point, I had to just sever it because it was so unhealthy. It was borderline abusive. It was manipulative behavior. And I realized, okay, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't sacrifice my sanity and my peace to try to please someone who doesn't want to be appeased. They don't want reconciliation. They want confrontation because they gain satisfaction in being right. Some people are like that. Some people just gain satisfaction in winning the argument, in being on the top, in dominating other people. And so they'll try to get many apologies out of you again and again and again and again. All the while, no apology you could ever make will ever reconcile the relationship. And there is a point at which you have to pull away and step away from people. But this doesn't mean even that the door is closed to those individuals. This just means that until they change that behavior, reconciliation just isn't possible. Don't fall for that manipulation. Some people manipulate you. Remember this, just because someone is hurt, doesn't mean they are right. Just become, just because someone is hurt doesn't mean they are right. Now, we have to be very careful about this because sometimes your spouse, sometimes your pastor, sometimes someone to whom you feel you should show loyalty will come to you and say, this hurt me. And sometimes those are valid things. Other times, they try to use the guilt of you having hurt them to manipulate you into doing what they want you to do. Please hear this. This is so key that you get this. Sometimes they will use the manipulation of you having hurt them 
They'll make you feel that guilt and they will use the guilt mm. to manipulate you into mm-hmm. doing what they want you to do. Wow. So you hurt me and you did this, this, and this. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I won't have it. And they go, okay, well now do this. And they want to shift everything. They want to they they bring you under that control. And if you don't live under their control, they act hurt with you. Oh, someone needs to hear this Ooh, today. Man, oh man. This is witchcraft, guys. They, 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 will, they, will, they will keep you living in guilt. You hurt me, you hurt me, you hurt me. And, and what happens is they use that hurt to try to control you and they use the manipulation to keep you under that control. And instead of letting you just be, they, they, try to, they, they want to control you like a puppet. And each string that's attached to you is a point of guilt. Because if you feel bad enough, you'll bend over backwards to do what they want you to do. Oh, this is something that people do. Then they give you this silent treatment. <laughs> then they start. Then they start with the the, the talking, you know, the, the talking behind your back. And then they, they just, these things, guys, come from one place. It's spiritual manipulation. Spiritual manipulation. Some of you are living in homes. You you live in a household. I really sense somebody's watching me right now. You live in a household. Nobody else really pulls their weight financially. You do all the work. They treat you like their little slave. And when you try to go and find some independence, they use the, they pull the family card. Well, your family, you're supposed to be here and help us. All the while, they live in laziness. You need to get out of that house. You need to get some people out of your house. You need to stop living under the manipulation of people. And you know who does it the most, sadly, is family. Mm, family wow. does it the most. Because they, fu- pu- they pull that family card. Blood is thicker than water. No one's ever going to love you like your family. You know, that's not even true. That's not even true. Ask Cain and Abel. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't loyalty. That wasn't, that wasn't love. Just because someone is blood related to you doesn't mean they're loyal to you. Doesn't mean you owe them loyalty. Blood alone does not produce loyalty. It's love. It's sacrifice. It's selflessness. Be there for the people who are there for you. Bend for the people who bend for you. Compromise for the people who compromise for you. I'm not talking about holiness. I'm talking about on agreements. Don't live under the manipulation of others who try to control you with guilt. You hurt me and therefore I'm right. It's not the case. Just because someone is hurt doesn't mean they are right. Mm. Now, sometimes we know we've hurt someone and sometimes we don't, but we must be open to apologizing. I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up to me and say, you know, you really offended me with this or you really hurt me with that. And I, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I'll say, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> They're like, oh, well, years ago we met and did it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I was probably really tired. That probably was it. Well, you didn't smile. Well, I was probably exhausted when you found me or saw me. I don't know. And so, you know, I try to be cordial in every single interaction, but sometimes people just catch you at a bad moment. And there's been times where I'm arguing in an argument with a, with a staff member where things are going wrong behind the scenes and someone right then wants to come up and, hey, are you so-and-so? Like, yes, but give me just a moment, just one second, please. I need to go, you know, fix this issue. And people don't know. People are, people are human. I say all that to say that sometimes I know I've hurt someone and sometimes I don't. But always be ready to offer an apology, even if it's petty, guys, even if it's petty. And if it becomes a repeat pattern, watch out for that manipulation Steve, I want to check in with our chat now. So yeah, I got a lot of the chat responding uh, to the points that you've been making. I think a lot of the people are agreeing and they they really do. Uh, I mean, this fire, like again, this chat is on fire. I can't even keep up, but they agree completely 100%. And I think this topic and this point is so, so deep and so, so good because some people don't know how to handle that situation. Some people don't realize that they're even under something like that. But bitterness, my goodness, this this topic, like I said, is just it, the chat is lighting up with comments and likes and, and I, it I, it's amazing. It looks like we're 60% there, 600 likes. And I know people come in and out. So guys, you have to keep telling, the chat has to keep telling people. So you see about seven, six, 700 people watching but you don't realize about 100 of those shuffle in and out. So we drop 100, then another 100 come in. There's really about, whenever you see a live stream number, usually a smaller percentage are actually watching consistently. So make sure you're getting people to like the video because that's how you're gonna trigger this giveaway. In the meantime, I do wanna share another portion of scripture with you before we get into the Q&A. So stick with us here just for a moment. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 29 through 31. Now, remember that this is Jesus talking here. 
Mark chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 29 through 31. And again, we're going to get to the Q&A right after this. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you, I love those words, I assure you, that's Jesus talking. By the way, the context here in, math, in Mark chapter 10, this is the story of the rich young ruler, where Jesus calls a man to follow him, and because of his great riches, he went away sorrowful instead of turning his life toward the Lord. So Jesus offers this man an opportunity, come follow me, come join me. I'm sure that's what would have happened had he not been held back by his riches. And because he was so in love with money, because he was so in love with this world, he missed an opportunity to follow Jesus's ministry while Jesus was physically here on the earth. Think about that. Oh, what you and I would give for that moment what you and I would do to stand in his shoes, knowing what we know now. Now, today, I'm sure he regrets it wherever he is. He regrets it. He regrets it, I guarantee you. Thousands of years have passed. What did he gain? Nothing. What did that mean? Nothing. What was that moment? Nothing. He turned from the Lord because he was so in love with riches. Now, Jesus says to the disciples after this interaction with the rich young ruler, the disciples come to him talking about rich people. And Jesus says, yes, and I assure you. So this is coming from the highest authority. Jesus himself is saying, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, in property, along with persecution. So we can't accuse Jesus of the prosperity gospel here because he says, you're going to get all those things plus persecution. He throws that in as a bonus, if you will. Along with persecution and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Another version says that you'll receive a hundredfold both in this life and the next. So that's coming from Jesus. Now, I recall a moment where I was a little bit nervous about one of the needs that the ministry had. And the Holy Spirit assured me, I'm going to take care of that ministry need. Don't worry, your finances will be met. Now, I believed the Holy Spirit, but still a part of me worried. There was some doubt in my heart. And so even though the Holy Spirit told me very clearly, I'm going to take care of the need, I still struggled in my heart. I was a little nervous. I was constantly waiting. Okay, Lord, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? And then a gentleman comes, he writes a check to the ministry. It covered the need that we had. And as soon as I had that check in my hand, Ah, I breathed a sigh of relief. Now, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit convicted me there because he told me, the Holy Spirit told me, he says, when you trust in my voice as much as you trust in a man's signature, then you know you have faith. In other words, I had more faith in that man's signature than I did in the Holy Spirit's voice. And I was heavily convicted for that. We often talk about faith, Lord, I trust you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I, Lord, I believe you, Lord, I'm, I'm gonna follow you, Lord, I'm abandoning all when it comes down to our finances, we're so easily swayed, we become fearful. We, we tighten up. We say, no, 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 I can't let this go. This, this is mine. Or no, wait, 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 Lord. Maybe God doesn't want this from me. We try to spiritualize our lack of faith by saying, well, you know, I got to use wisdom. Or, oh, I got to save it for this or for that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus himself said, I assure you. Jesus is saying that to you. These words apply to you. Jesus is saying, I assure you. Whatever you give up, you're going to receive a hundredfold in this life and in the world to come, you're going to have a reward. Trust the words of Jesus. Step out in faith today and sow a gift into this ministry. Sow a gift of $25. Will you do that right now? A gift of $25. You can do that by using the YouTube Super Chat or you can go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. The information is right there at the bottom of the screen. If you go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate, it'll take you no more than a minute or two, max three minutes to give a gift. We accept all currencies from countries all around the world. You can give through Apple Pay, through Google Pay, through PayPal. Give a gift of $25. And if you can, do a gift of 50. Do a gift of 100. Somebody watching right now, you can do a gift of 1,000. There's even someone else watching right now, you can do more than 1,000. You can do a significant 
gift into this ministry right now. Help support the live streams. Help support the media. Help support the events that we do all around the world and that we give away for free. We never charge for an event. We don't charge for these live streams. We don't charge for the content that we release. We don't even charge for the Holy Spirit School, which is an online school where people can be trained in the Word of God. And we don't charge for that. It's all partner supported. So if you believe in this ministry and you want to stand with us and you want to be a part of what God is doing, Spirit family, I'm asking you for your help. I'm asking you to join hands with us in the carrying of the gospel to the nations of the world. I'm seeing the gifts come in from all over the world. I will actually see your name if you give before we go off the air, I'll be able to see your name right here on my phone. Of course, your gift will still count if you're watching the replay, but if you give while we're live, I'll see the donations come in. The Patrick family just gave a very donation, a very, very um, generous donation to the ministry. So thank you to the Patrick family. Javier Turan, thank you so much for your support. I also see Marita Bo, our dear friend, giving to the ministry. Uh, Steve will be on the Super Chat in just a moment. Brisaida Vega gave a one-time gift at davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Go right now. Don't, don't wait for, for the flesh to kick in. Sometimes we do that. We kind of debate back and forth. Maybe someone else will do it. No, this is for you to respond to. You're a part of the Spirit family. You receive from the Word today, and you're being blessed by the ministry. You believe in what we're doing. You want to help us win more souls. Jump on board. Step out in faith. See what God will do. What you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. So if you feel fearful about the future, don't. God is your source. God will supply. Come on. All you have to do is release. Just release and trust in Him. Give a gift of $25. Give a gift of $50. Give a gift of $100. There's someone watching who could do $1,000. There's someone else watching who can do more. Go and support the ministry. Again, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate or you can give via the Super Chat, all sorts of ways to give from all around the world. And if you can, partner with us monthly. It makes all the difference in the world. When you partner with us monthly at $10 or more a month, you get access to the partner Zoom calls. You get, um, you get um, a special email update that we send out with access to the partner Zoom call. And sometimes there's extra content in there for the partners and supporters. But every partner gets one of these right here. This is a World Changers, uh, this is a World Changers pin. I'm going to actually straighten this out. There we go. I believe in doing all things with excellence, even straightening the pin. <laughs> right there. I'm going to put this up here so it's easier for you, Britt. There we go. World Changers pin. This is something that our partners have and they wear to show their support of the gospel. If you become a monthly supporter, we're going to send this to you. You can wear this to the events or really anywhere. Uh, Ruben puts it on his backpack. It's just our little way of saying thank you. Look, guys, some of you support Netflix. Some of you support iTunes. Some of you support all sorts of other stuff. Some of you go to Starbucks. I, I know Starbucks mm. drinks on average are like $5. Come on. Give up two cups of coffee a month. Give up something for the gospel. And if you don't have to give up something, great. You're blessed. Go and just support the ministry. Hey, thank you to Darney Hollywood, who just became a monthly supporter. Thank you, Megan, for your one-time gift. Thank you, Yeleni, for your one-time gift. Thank you, Tinsy Thomas, for your one-time gift. Thank you, Nancy Church. Thank you also to Joseph Adai. And so many other names coming in. Steve, we got the Super Chat as well. So over on YouTube Super Chat, this is going to be a good one. I have Gloria Chang gave. I have Nebulous gave. I have Marcia. Marcia. I also have Carol. We thank you so much. Morgan, we thank you. Rosa Parra, thank you so much. And the Super Chat, like I said, is lighting up. There's so many more people that it's uh, taking me a minute on my side to load. We also have uh, Norita that gave. Thank you so, so very much over on YouTube Super Chat. And again, guys, we so appreciate your support. All of it goes toward the gospel. It's, it's such an important thing that the people of God partner together in doing this. So you may think, oh, it's just my one gift. No, no, you don't realize that in, in joining your gift with all the others who are giving right now, you're really making a huge impact together. So that's very, very important. I'm going to get in the Q&A right now. Steve's going to prep some questions. Before I do, just a reminder, July 9th, 10th, and 11th, we're going to be in Northern California. July 9th and 10th will be Fremont, California. July 11th will be Hayward, California. The 9th and 10th in Fremont, Friday and Saturday, will be miracle services. The Sunday night in Hayward is going to be a miracle service. We're going to pray for the sick. There's going to be worship. But I'm going to more heavily focus on the teaching. It's going to be a spiritual warfare seminar. 
July 25th, we're going to be in Orange, California for our monthly miracle service. We are going to pray over pictures of your loved ones who you want to see come to the cross. This is very, very key. You want to see them come to Jesus, bring their photos. It's a point of contact, a point of faith. We're going to pray over that and believe that your household will be saved in the name of Jesus. And on top of that, I'll be teaching on how to win your loved ones to the Lord. So again, July 9th, 10th, and 11th, we'll be in Northern California. And then on July 25th, we will be in Southern California. Check davidhernandezministries.com slash events for information on all of our upcoming events. As Steve's prepping those questions, I'm going to thank Matu Smith, Patty Romo, Carmen, and Kate and Kanisha and Brianna. And I also see Judith. Thank you, Judith. You're such a blessing. Pam and Galen Mays are dear friends. By the way, Britain's right here in front of me. He's doing a great job. You want to come wave at your mom real quick? Britain, come say hi to your mom. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you, but you have to say hi to your mom. Prove that we're feeding you, okay? See, we're feeding him. He's good. <laughs> He's well taken care of. And then I also want to thank Raul Bruinberg. Bru Bru thank you so much for your gift. Uh, Claudia Wente, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Okay, we're going to do something a little bit different. Steve's going to be watching that chat for your questions. Ruben is going to put a chat in there on the chat. He's going to put the information for how you can access us on Zoom. Now, please hear me. Go to Zoom once you ask your question, jump on over on YouTube, help us with our numbers. By the way, you guys are at 700 likes. And remember, 1,000 likes triggers that giveaway so that we're going to send it off um, two books, Carriers of the Glory in English and Carriers of the Glory in Chinese. So make sure you're doing that. Again, uh, we're at 702 likes. So Ruben, go ahead and drop that right now. Ruben is dropping in the chat. He's dropping the Zoom links. So not everyone jump over there because I don't want to kill our live stream over here on YouTube, but a few of you jump on there if you have a good question. Um, it's not for prayer requests. Not we're gonna. I'm going to pray before we go. Steve and Britain, don't let me end before I pray again. You that's got important. It. So I'm going to pray before we go. So this is not for prayer requests. This is for theological questions, Bible questions. Ask me a question on the Holy Spirit. Ask me a question on spiritual warfare, on prayer, on any of those subjects, or maybe something that I covered today ask about the ministry, ask about Stephen, whatever you'd like, jump on over to Zoom. It's a special open lines Q&A. They're dropping those right now, the Zoom links. And while you guys jump over on Zoom, go ahead, Steve, and show me what you got on the questions. You got it. So this first question, and again, I'm looking at the YouTube chat here. So again, if you want to get your question answered, drop it right now. Let's spam this chat with your questions, and I will see them as many as I can. So this first question comes from our friend Emily Laramore. Emily wanted to know, what do you do when you know someone who has bitterness and uses it as manipulation but won't admit it? At some point, you're going to have to cut them off. I know that's mm. sad to say, but at some point, you have to cut them off. And this doesn't mean permanently. There have been several people in my life who I've had to distance myself from when they went through a season of bitterness. This is not to say that we leave people in their darkest times, but some people want help. Others want attention. If they actually want your help, stick with them. And it will be difficult helping people who suffer with bitterness, no doubt. But then there's also those who just want attention. They don't want solutions. They don't want help. They don't want to change. And they continue to manipulate you, make you feel guilty. They continue to tear you down. Some point you have to put some distance between you and them. Now, if it's a spouse, I wouldn't recommend putting certain barriers on that relationship because, you know, you obviously want to reconcile that marriage. And that's a relationship you have to fight to keep and stay connected to that person. But even in a marriage, there are at least some emotional boundaries. Like, for example, if your spouse is highly manipulative, don't give them control over your mood. Don't let them, don't let them speak a few words and tear you down to where you're sad all of a sudden and it's weighing on you the whole day. If you do that, they know they have that power and they're going to keep using that power on you. Don't let them control when you're happy, when they're in a good mood, you're in a good mood, when they're in a bad mood, you're in a bad mood. Now, it's one thing to feel hurt when those are hurting, and it's one thing to feel happiness when those are happy, but it's another thing entirely for them to use that to control us to get their way. Don't let them have control over your emotions. You keep control over your emotions. And if they're going through a difficult time, have compassion, hurt with them, but don't let them manipulate you to the point to where just because they're not getting their way, they make you feel just down and sad and weighted 
Don't give them that power. That's mm. not a power not even your spouse should have. You are in control of your emotions. You are in control of your mood. Don't give them that power. Keep a level head. Keep grounded in the word of God. Stay true to the scripture. Know that Jesus loves you and he's the source of your joy and peace. And then from there, if someone's hurting and they're genuinely going through something, hurt with them. That's okay to hurt with them. If they're joyful, be joyful with them. But don't let them use your happiness and your, your, your sorrow as a means to control you. Don't let them have that. We thank you for that question. Before we jump into the next one here, as Ruben is getting set up over there as well, Hold I want on. to thank, go right ahead. Sorry, Kaya San just put something in the comment section. There, it just, it just disappeared right there. Kaya San said something so powerful. I'm going to try to find it on my screen here. Have emotional intelligence, respond, not react. This is actually something I say in my home all the time, something a philosophy Jess and I have. Don't react, respond. When you react to something, it's instant, it's reflexive, it's not thought out. When you respond to something, you're being methodical with the way you're reacting to it. So reaction is a natural, without any thought, something that happens, and, and a response is something that you, you, you think out, you plan, you're intentional. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. I want to thank Custom Dove over on YouTube Super Chat. Thank you so much, as well as Sheeny. Wait, um, what was the name of that person? Custom Dove. Custom Dove. What a perfect name yeah. for someone who watches this channel. This really is the Holy Spirit's channel, and this really is the Spirit family. People who love the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And we thank you for that, as well as Mama Key, as well as... Unseti, thank you guys so much. And there's more super chats I'll thank. But if you want to go ahead and get into another question or if you want to ready thank for Jasmine Zoom. Barcia, thank you, Jasmine. I want to thank, I'm going to try to say this correctly, Kwoningya Okango, who also gave a one time gift. Thank you to Maha Jane Ramos, who became a monthly ministry partner. Yuliera Jetho also became a monthly ministry partner. I believe they're from Canada. Carol Watts gave a generous one-time gift. Thank you, Carol, for that one-time gift. We so appreciate you. And let's now get into the Q&A. All right. Did you want to take one from Zoom or you want to go on YouTube? Good question. Um, I think we should go to Zoom real quick. All right. Ruben, do we have anybody on Zoom? Yes, sir. We have a handful. Okay. Who's the first one? Nordia. Nordia? Ruben says your name is Nordia. We're going to take yes, your call. Yes, Nordia. Hi. Welcome. Yes, Hi. Good night. Um... I am Roman's mother, and so my son has um, been introduced, um, been telling me about you. All right, so my question that I have for you is that um, I have been a Christian, um, been a child of God. So I've been a child of God for the past 13 years, and I have been facing with a lot of things, and I have been fasting, I've been praying, um, but it's very hard to figure some things out. So one of the things that I realized mostly is that my life has been heavily oppressed financially. Mm. Um, even last night I had a dream and I could see like um, there were groups of people surrounding my finances wanting me to go into deep poverty. And I would, I don't know how to, I know to pray because I'm praying about it, but how do I get relief entirely from oppressive forces wanting me to fall into deep financial poverty. Thank you for that question. I think it's an important one. And this right here, I'm going to answer your question, but, but, but please understand I'm working from a foundation of Scripture. Number one, it is not biblical to say, and this is not an attack on you by any means, this is something that I teach often, so please understand that um, I, I hope I'm coming across respectful toward you and your circumstance, but this will help you maybe shift your thinking in this area. Number one, it's not biblical to say that a Christian can be oppressed. Number two, it's not biblical to say that a Christian can be cursed. You cannot curse what God has called blessed. This is some of the danger of some of the spiritual warfare teaching that Christians believe, and it produces fruits that are not in keeping with the truth of the Word of God. In fact, some of these spiritual warfare teachings come from religious thinking. I don't know about you, but when I look at Scripture, I see that Jesus was against religious teachings. 
when the true power is flowing, it stirs up religious spirits. And that's why people are so resistant to the truth of the word of God sometimes. In your specific case, you're talking about financial oppression. Now, first of all, the Old Testament concept of financial curse, you know, we read the book of Malachi, is not the same thing as the New Testament concepts of money, okay? So, in the Old Testament, that curse that came upon people who didn't give was from God himself. Now, who among us is so anointed that we can cast out God? Not possible. So this notion that finances can be cursed, at least for the believer, is not a biblical notion at all. And if it is a biblical notion, that we have to be completely consistent in saying that the curse comes directly from God and not from some demonic being, which God doesn't do that to believers. Rather, what the scripture teaches is that God will meet the needs of the believer and the unbeliever. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, the scripture says. Jesus talked about the fact that, you know, he talked about not sowing and still receiving. He talked about the lilies of the field. They don't toil, yet they're clothed in splendor that not even Solomon knew. So we have to have a biblical framework to work from if we're going to answer this question. So having established that, what then is it that you're facing? Well, you're probably very stressed about finances. You probably believe that your finances are oppressed, and that stress and that belief are producing the dream. And the dream is reinforcing the belief in the oppression and the stress. And so you get caught in this cycle of confirmation bias. In other words, I believe there's a curse, so I have a dream about the curse, and then the dream about the curse enforces my belief about the curse, and it just keeps going and going and going and going. You're blessed. You are blessed and highly favored. Instead, what the scripture talks about when it, when, it's, when it mentions financial blessing, take 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's very clear that in giving generously to the gospel, we're positioning ourselves for blessing. But the scripture also talks about wise stewardship of your money. So some people are givers, but they're not good stewards. And so they're giving, but their stewardship is bleeding them out. And some people are really good stewards, but they're not great givers. Yeah, they may be stable, but that abundant blessing that comes from giving isn't upon them. So it's going to come from both financial stewardship and faith-filled generosity. And then the consistency of those two together will produce financial blessings. So what you probably need to do is sit down, go over your finances, go line upon line, as the scripture says, go line upon line. Look at your expenses. Look at your income. You may need to adjust your lifestyle to meet that level of comfort. You may have to lower your standard of living in order that you might free up some cash. This is a mistake. I feel like uh, Dave Ramsey now. <laughs> this is a mistake a lot of people make is they, 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 they don't know how to free up their cash. Your monthly income is your one of your greatest assets for at least being able to have a position in being able to gain wealth. Some people they 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 make if they make five thousand a month, their expenses are at five thousand a month, and they keep it there. And so every month they're stressed. And if they get a raise to seven thousand, well now their expenses go to seven thousand. They get a more expensive house, a more expensive apartment, or they add a car. No 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 no. Try to keep that gap as wide as possible between your expenses and your income so that there's free cash every single month that you're pouring into your savings. Now, you're not going to get rich by saving money. That doesn't happen. But what you do now is you have extra cash each month, extra cash each year to cover unexpected circumstances and at the same time to invest in a business idea, to invest in some project that you're doing, to invest in something that could ultimately return more money. So when you cut your finances down to the wire, and when you barely have enough left over each month, you're actually making it very difficult to pull yourself out of whatever state you're in financially. So good stewardship, faithful generosity, faithfulness in both of those, and keeping a good look at your books, that's going to bring you right out of that. And as you follow that, watch that pattern. It will work. There's no oppression. There's no curse. You can't curse what God has blessed, especially if you're a giver. So from there, it's a matter of stewardship, faith-filled giving, and faithfulness in the two. Look at your money. Go down the line, and I promise you, if you adjust your standard of living and you pull things from here and there, really look at what you need and don't need, 
there's going to be some free cash that actually accumulates over time and you use that to invest in certain things. That's how I do it. You know, not not all of my in income comes from the check that I get from the ministry. I get a salary from the ministry, yes, but I save a lot of that excess income. My wife and I keep a very clear budget every month and every month we have extra money we put that either into savings or we say what can we do with this and i'll put it into an idea or maybe i have some friends who own businesses sometimes i'll invest in their businesses and it returns back to me and then i just repeat that and it starts to accumulate upon itself and exponentially so anyway i hope that that helps i know this is you know money is spiritual people think you know well, why is he talking about money money is spiritual and it's important that we understand spiritual principles. So I hope that answered your question. Ruben, who else do we have coming on? Nicholas. Nicholas, welcome to Viral Revival. Hi, Pastor David. Hi, God bless you. What's your question, my friend? I have been wondering, I know that you have spoken about bitterness. I'm sorry, can you speak up a little and a little more clearly, please? Yes. Uh, my question is, how can you deal with bitterness about yourself, not about others. Ah. I mean, when you feel, I mean, this self-examination that we were, you were talking and all these things, it's good when you know that it's directed at someone else, but when it's about yourself, I don't know. <laughs> it, no, it's That's, a great question. It's a great question, and I'm glad you brought it up. That's actually a point I didn't even really get to cover. Excellent question. What do you do when you're How do you deal with shame? Bitterness towards self is shame. You, you don't like yourself. There's, there's anger toward yourself, frustration with yourself. It comes in realizing the truth that the grace of God applies to you as well. Sometimes we work ourselves into a frenzy and we freak ourselves out because we have all of these ideas floating around our heads. Ideas like, well, God's done with me or, you know, the grace of God applies to them, but not to me. Or God can forgive that, but he can't forgive what I did. And so these notions ultimately are unfruitful in our lives, and we have to be rid of them. We have to cast down those imaginations. Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God must be brought down, and we must choose instead to believe the Word of God. So in your specific case, you're talking about bitterness against self, unforgiveness against self. It comes in knowing the Word and believing the Word and choosing to believe the Word instead of the lies of the enemy. Recognize that the grace of God applies to you as well. God's forgiveness applies to you in the same way that it would apply to anybody else. So make sure that you recognize first the lie, expose that lie, and then pull out a truth from the scripture to confront that lie, and you'll be set free from that shame. Reuben, who else do we have? Edward, Edward welcome to Viral Revival. What's your question, my friend? Uh, hello, hello, David. Um, I want to make sure you can hear me, right? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, that's perfect. Um, well, uh, first off, God, God, God willing, uh, and, and I and I ask for your prayers for that. Uh, I'm going to be preaching tomorrow on the church. Oh wow! And um, that will be my first time. <laughs> oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah, and uh, what? Well, well, last last week, I'm I'm, I'm going to get to the question. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Well, last week, um, I was talking to a preacher, mm -hmm. and I w and I wanted I wanted to uh, I, w I was explaining to her that um, that I want to make sure to get prepared to get prepared for when I become an evangelist, which I believe is what God has called me, and uh, and she gave me two words. Uh, I'm sorry, three words. You are ready. And uh, and I and I and I asked myself, uh, okay, the question is, um, uh, when and how do I start? And tomorrow, and my tomorrow's preaching might be the answer. Now then, um, my my question is, how? What would you advise me? What 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 would be your advice to go to go from there into, you know, what I mean? I don't. What What do you mean? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the the question is um, after my first preaching, and after hearing hearing hear, hearing the preacher said that I'm ready. Uh -huh. What would you advise? What would you advise me to go to go from here? As far as preparation for your sermon tomorrow. Um. Well. Well. I'm. Well. Try I phrasing mean, the question in a different way. Maybe that'll help me out. 
okay, uh, what, what, what would you advise me to go, um, um, to go, to go from, to go from there as, as I, as I, as I go forward that, that I may, that, that I may be ready to be continuing to preach in the future. Oh, that's it. So, so you uh, you want to know how to continue in the path of your calling. Right, right, something like that, right. Okay, well, I'll try to answer it as best I could. Forgive me, um, sometimes um, I don't understand every question. I, I do apologize for that, but um, I'm going to answer it as best I can. What I, what I understand you saying is, or asking is that you want to know how to best prepare for faithfulness and to continue on and how do you keep this momentum going and so forth. Um, first of all, that, that first portion you mentioned, I'm not sure how all, all that ties in with the question, um, so I'm not going to be able to address that. But I will say that if somebody wants to continue in their calling with God, they need to continue just to do the basics. I think sometimes we make the mistake of believing that there's some secret recipe to the anointing or there's some hidden mystery that we don't know about ministry and the call of God and that maybe something that the greats have discovered that we just don't know no matter how much we search the scriptures. And the reality is that it all comes down to the basics. It all comes down to a love for Jesus. All true ministry is an overflow of your love for Jesus. If it's not an overflow of your love for Jesus, it's not ministry. It's, it's a career, it's charity, it's organizational work, it's volunteer work. Unless it's born of a love for Jesus, it is not ministry. And this is something we have to really be sold on because if we move from this point, then everything that we do will become polluted with self. We must be rooted in this truth. All true ministry is founded upon a love for Jesus. From that come things like a prayer life, a devotion to the Word of God, personal holiness, which is so key, and such. Now, of course, in devotion to the Word of God, we must know the Word of God. We must study the Word of God. We must be in the Word daily. If you don't know the Word, you have no business being in a pulpit. We must have a prayer life. If you're not in daily prayer, you have no business being in the pulpit. There are areas of holiness, standards that we need to meet. Now, not everyone's going to live perfect. Nobody lives perfect, and we all fail in some points. But it's that striving for holiness and meeting a certain criteria that we see in the book of Timothy that we find our qualification for ministry. So long as you're doing these basic things and you're keeping that core the core, then there's no stopping the call of God on your life. I mean, I could, I could give you preaching tips, broadcast tips, social media tips, organizational tips. But all of that is secondary to the priority, which is your love for Jesus. And so long as you maintain that simplicity and you never get distracted from that, you'll never waver. God bless you. Next question, Ruben. Verseda. Verseda, welcome to Viral Revival. Hi, David. God bless you. God bless you. Um, I just had a question. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but it kind of like relates. Um, okay. What to do, like, for example, for a person that deals with like a lot of OCD or just a bunch of unwanted blasphemous thoughts. Um, I like, I don't want to be angry all the time, but they make me super, super angry every yeah. single day. So now keep, how keep her we, on the line. What, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is gonna be more of a conversation. So I'm gonna ask you to stay on the line. Continue. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just didn't want them to to mute you after your question. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, like, what can you suggest I can do to like, I guess, guard my heart when it's a it's a constant thing every single day, and I try myself to like say, you know what, I'm gonna try to be joyful today. I'm gonna try not to deal with it, but they just don't leave. Like, the thoughts are still there, no matter how... Like, I'm not saying that they're always going to be there. My faith is still in God. Like, I know they're going to leave at some point. But for now, what do I do now? Like, it's making me very bitter. Mm. It's constant judgmental thoughts that I don't even know where they come from. And bitter just toward, to bitter toward God, toward other people, bitter toward who? No, like, it's just random, random blasphemous thoughts against God. That's how it started. And then I, I started I started noticing that I'm starting to become very, very like angry. Like every single day, like everything irritates me because they're just there and they don't leave. Right. Now um, now are you are you a born again believer? Yes. Okay. I mean I I I gave my life to Christ like uh 
a year and a half ago and something similar like this was happening to me before that's that's what keep, uh, make me um come to christ but then it started again okay so that's why well, i'm a little bit confused well, like ruben still know. keep her unmuted so so Bersida, am i saying it right Bersida? yes okay Bersida. let me tell you first and foremost that as a believer you have the holy ghost i know you know this here but sometimes these truths they get lost upon us in in the sense of feeling them right we we, we don't always feel the mm -hmm. truth we know the truth we don't always feel the truth that's the challenge here now these thoughts that come into your mind i want you to understand because i used to deal heavily with things like this i want you to understand first and foremost that you are not demon possessed you are not demon mm -hmm. oppressed this is not some demonic being forcing you to do these things. And I'll tell you how we know that. Number one, we know that demon possession is not some mild case. You may hear some people say things like, oh, well, they didn't even know they had a demon. That's not possible. A demonic possession is a very, very severe case. You and I could not be having this conversation if it was demon possession, I promise you. Uh, number mm -hmm. two, the fact that you are exercising your will so freely to be on this broadcast and talk to me about this it shows you have the Spirit of God. So let's, make, let's get that straight. You're a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You've got the power of God, the love of God. Pardon? Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, go ahead. I was saying you have the child of God. You have the po you're a child of God. You have the power of God. You have the anointing of God. You're positioned in Him. Now, these thoughts that come to the mind, because they come to your mind and you reject them, that's proof to you that you also have the exercise of free will in the mind. So these thoughts that come to you, you're almost got to play like ping pong with them. Because when a thought comes and burrows itself in the mind, that thought begins to gain influence over our other thought patterns as well as our emotions. So think of it like a game of ping pong. Whatsoever is lovely. Is it lovely? I got to knock that thing out. Whatsoever is true, is it true? Out. Whatsoever is of a good report, is it of a good report? Nope, okay, then out. You'll never be able to control what thoughts come to your mind. Nor can anybody control what thoughts come to their mind. I can't control what thoughts come to my mind. Nobody here can control what thoughts come to their mind. Nobody watching online right now can control what thoughts come to their mind. But they can control what thoughts they meditate on. And it's in that meditation that we see those thoughts gain power over us. Now, with you, Brasida, because of it's because of it's kind of mixed with OCD, one of the biggest challenges for you is going to be the obsession over the thought itself. So when someone has OCD, it's not just the thought coming into their head. It's the thought coming into their head, the worry that they can't control the thought, the wondering if they can control the thought, the wondering if more thoughts are going to come along with it, the worry about how long this is going to stay in my head, the worry about the mm -hmm. consequences of having this thought. You see, we start to assess the assessment of the assessment of the thought. And so we start to right. study this thought in every which way in this angle. So instead of allowing your mind to study it, now you're not studying the thought to try to dwell on it. You're trying to defeat that thought, not realizing that it's actually the analysis of that thought that's making it gain mm -hmm. power over you in the first place. So that worry of, oh my goodness, is this going to stop? Is going to produce more. Like people who worry about having night terrors. That constant worry about having a night terror, guess what? It's going to produce more night terrors. And if they believe that they've been set free from night terrors, guess what? The night terrors are going to stop. So as it goes with OCD, though there are some other aspects to this I'm sure you're more familiar with, this is one of the basic yeah. principles I can give them is to not obsess about having the thoughts themselves. You're so worried about having the thoughts that it's actually paving the way for you to have more thoughts like that. God does not hold you accountable for the thoughts that pop into your head. He holds us accountable for the thoughts we choose, for the thoughts that we choose to meditate upon. And once you realize this truth that I, look, I can't control every thought that comes to my mind, nor can anybody. You're, you're driving down the street. A lot, of, a lot of men can tell you this. Driving down the street, they see a billboard. There's a thought. Now, they couldn't control what thought came to their mind, 
but we can control whether we dwell on it or not. So you're not in trouble with God because something popped into your head because something reminded you of something. Can so, I just ask yeah. how? How what? How uh, I'm just I'm just trying to get like a better understanding because I know you've always spoken about that you've had OCD before. So they seem to be literally like I don't mean to exaggerate, but literally rapid fire. How do I not meditate on that thing? <laughs> just and that that how to is is probably the question that gets put most to me on this. Um, it, it would be the same thing, you know, trying to describe to somebody how how do you hear, how do you see? It, it's it's just something that you 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 begin to naturally learn as you attempt to practice it. So it may be clumsy in the beginning, and it may not be as potent mm -hmm. as you want it to be in the beginning. But once you've accepted, I can control my thoughts, then that muscle begins mm -hmm. to be strengthened. Right now. That muscle of controlling the thoughts, it's, it's, it's tired. It's tired because you're just boom, 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 mm. boom, 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 being bombarded by it. It's, you're, right. you're mentally mm. exhausted. And it is mentally exhausting when you deal with stuff like that. So wow. realize first, like I said, this, this will help. Realize, number one, that, that you can't control what comes to your mind. You can only control what stays in your mind. Once you've released yourself from that, you can focus all your energy on what stays in your mind rather than worrying about the consequences of these things that just pop into your head. Mm. And so that's number one. Number two, the perspective of the battle is off. You're choosing to focus on the battle with these thoughts right here. So like if I say, don't think of the number seven, too late. You and everyone else just thought of the number seven. So by focusing on the battle itself, oh my goodness, all these thoughts, what do I do about them? You're never going to get out of it that way. Instead, rather... The Bible doesn't say, don't think about these things. It says, think on these things. Fill your mind with other things. Wow. And that will strengthen your ability to resist the things that ought not to be there. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. And I know yes, even yes. hearing this, you're like, okay, I get it. And it, it can almost seem like a little like, okay, got some work ahead of me. And maybe even a little discouraging because right. you may say, well, I tried that before. But here's the thing. I used to say that. I would go through the cycles of it. I already tried that. I already tried that. And then I would say, okay, but have I tried it every day for a year yet? Probably not. Okay. And so, so keep going. You're, you're going you're gonna to get breakthrough. It's going to happen. Yeah. This wow. is a, as the spirit strengthens yes. and the flesh gets shrunk, you're going to have breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And just, just have peace knowing that God understands what you're going through. And that he's not, he's not, he's not angry with you because of this, the, these thoughts. I'm sure there's things in your past that led you to this, that brought this about, but, but there's freedom in knowing the truth and that truth will set you free. Once you know, you don't have to fight that battle. That's not yours to fight. Just focus on other things. Not, not, I'm not saying try not to focus on those thoughts. I'm saying choose to focus on other things. It's a very different thing, Steve. You know, I have, uh, I wanted to add on to that. I mean, this is such an interesting thing because what you're speaking of, I know a lot of us have dealt with it and something I'm trying to do as well. And I'm, I'm in the same, you know, situation. Sometimes thoughts come to my mind. What I try to do is memorize as many scripture as I possibly can to combat that thought. So when that thought comes, you already have a scripture loaded, ready to go and say, nope, wait a minute, this scripture says otherwise. And so I think that's something you can start applying today. And I think, again, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, you know, sometimes, like I said, these things come, but I know when you have scripture, when you have that backing of the Lord and, and just everything about his word, you can get through it. And so what Diga is saying is so, so true. I mean, the Bible says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Perfect peace. That's the promise. And Brasida, you're going to get that. I promise you. It may seem like a long uphill battle, but there's going to be a day you look back and you're going to say, I used to struggle with this, but today mm. I'm set free. Why? How? By the power of the word. Amen. By the power of the word. Fill your mind with the word, and there won't be room for those other things. I want to thank Alpha Lobby, who gave a generous one-time gift. I'd also like to thank Melanie Galano, who gave a generous one-time gift over at davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. Ruben, who else do we have? Ramon, welcome to Viral Revival. What's your question, my friend? I think they're having tickets. Oh, there he is. Let's see the other. Uh, okay. I've been watching you for a while now, about months now. Oh, God week, bless you. 
wants more than us. And I just have this like passion to receive what you have on you right now, that anointing, that gift of healing, that thing. Why? Because when I go out to evangelize, because I was taught to be an evangelist. And so when I go to evangelize, I just want to prove that Christ is the only Lord by those miracles and deliverance. That's awesome, so, my friend. I'm happy to hear that, that, that you have this passion it. to be used of God. So, so what is, what's your question? Who do you pray for me? receive that anointing oh absolutely we're gonna we're gonna pray definitely uh, we always close in prayer so I'll definitely pray toward the end of the broadcast I'm gonna pray for everyone um, do you have a specific question in this area or something like that oh yes how do I increase in the gift um, of healing and Ex how do I excellent. the baptism of the so so strengthening the spiritual gifts Whatever strengthens my spirit strengthens the things that come from my spirit. The gift of healing is a spiritual gift. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So as I strengthen my spirit, whatever comes about as a result of my spirit will always be strengthened when my spirit is strengthened. So that is how you strengthen the spiritual gifts, how you strengthen your prayer life, how you strengthen your knowledge of the word, how you strengthen... Um, the gift of prophecy even, it all comes from growing the Spirit. Growing the Spirit comes by the Holy Spirit when you walk according to the Holy Spirit. So it really comes down to these basic things. And this goes back to my point that I was making earlier. I think we imagine sometimes that people have these hidden secrets, right? So people come to our healing services and they'll watch all the people get healed at the services and they'll come up to me after, what's the key, what's the secret? Say, just love Jesus. They're like, no, 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 but what's, what is it like, really? Like, they think I'm going to give them like a regimen. Okay, on Mondays, you fast for three hours. And then on Tuesdays, you read a thousand healing scriptures. And then Wednesdays, and this is important on Wednesdays, make sure that you're facing north when you pray with the anointing bottle in your hands. You know, like, like there's going to be all these little things. And, and the Bible gives us everything we need to walk in the anointing. You have an anointing. You're anointed of God. You have a spiritual gift. It's so, so, so simple. Everything that is spiritual is always simple. Whatever is religious is always complex. So when you increase in the anointing, really all you're doing is surrendering to what God has already given to you. You can't get more of the anointing. The anointing's in you. You can't get more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in you. You can't get more power. All of God's power is in you. It's a matter now of surrendering to that which God has already deposited in you and living that out in everyday life. How do you do that? Love Jesus. That love for Jesus will produce a devotion to the word, a lifestyle of holiness and repentance, and a lifestyle of prayer. Those three things. You do those three things. Read the word of God every day, morning and night. Pray as often as you can, as much as you can. And number three, live a lifestyle of holiness and repentance. And I say and repentance because sometimes we slip up. And instead of letting things go too far in one direction, you pull it back and say, Lord, cast me not away from your presence, even though New Testament doesn't speak of that. Of course, that's just quoting from the Psalms. The sentiment is there. I don't want anything that diminishes your influence in my life is what we're saying to him. So those three things, that really is it. Guys, there's, there's, there's no other secrets. There's no other secrets. Now, I could talk about how to set an atmosphere for healing. I could talk about how to stir up a spiritual gift. I could talk about how to stir up the anointing. These are all, in, they're nuanced, but they're basically the same thing. But it's not going to matter if you're not doing the basics. Do the basics, everything else will come. There's no shortcuts to the platforms and to ministries. You just love Jesus, trust God. He'll take you where you need to go. Who else do we have, Mr. Vargas? Yvette. Yvette, welcome to Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. What is your question? Yes, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this ministry to everybody. I was wondering two main things. Um, First one is how do you stay on fire? Like I've gone through seasons where it's like, wow, we're out. We're so passionate. You know, I used to drive Uber and minister to people and I had good success. And, and I, I mean, it's been really weird. My journey, I've only been a believer for 10 years. Wait, but can right I ask away, you a question was, real quick? I have to interrupt. Yeah. Were you yeah. the one who drove Steve and I? Did you ever drive me and Steve before? In Chicago? 
I don't know. Maybe? We had an Maybe Uber. We, we've had a couple run-ins with Uber drivers who who watch Encounter TV. Never mind. I'm sorry. It might not be you. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe I hope it was me. I hope <laughs> I did a good job. <laughs> um, but I think I just struggle a lot with sometimes just staying on fire. I go sometimes through rejection. So mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the first saved in my family, and I'm still the only spirit-filled believer. Um, and I get a lot of t attacks sometimes even to the point that it's tormenting, very discouraging to stay in my faith. And even when I do try to, I've tried like three different communities and I've just really struggled to be accepted. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I have, I've not always been a believer. I know through that journey, even though God can use us, you know, he uses us when we're healing or when we're broken. I think I've just struggled a lot to stay encouraged and then to even manifest what I believe the Lord has called me to do, which to me, sometimes I'm like, how can this be real Lord? Cause it just seems like everything is always against me. Um, so I think, I don't know if that's like a test to be spiritually rejected sometimes. I don't know. I just struggle with that. And the, that rejection is oftentimes what makes me just lose wind again. I'll just stop reading the word and I don't know, you know, that's really it. I just, I don't want to lose it. I want to manifest what I feel that I've been told multiple times over and over, but this season just feels really hard. So I don't, I don't want to always struggle with this. I don't want it to always be a battle that I have to come back to. I just want to get it done, you know, and, and keep momentum. Well, that's a good ambition to have. Certainly the ebb and flow of our lives doesn't have to include an ebb and flow in our love for Jesus. There can be, a consistent love for the Lord that we have all the days of our life, and it never has to fade. It never has to fade. What I'm hearing, and forgive me if I'm not answering the question directly, is I think that it comes down to being refreshed by the Lord himself. You know, you turn off this, this bright light that's in my face that Tim sticks in my face. You, you take away this microphone. I'm looking... I'm facing the other side of the studio. Our, our studio has two sets in it. One here is the Viral Revival set. Straight across from me is the main set that most of you see, you know, Moment of Truth, the teachings. I'm looking at it right now. There's lights, there's cameras. It's really elaborate in here. Shut off the lights, take away the cameras, turn off my microphone. Remove the crowds that come to the service. Remove this wonderful chat with our spirit family. What do I have? You see, if I didn't have that personal connection with the Lord, I promise you this thing, this machine that is ministry would have a long time ago crushed me into a million tiny pieces. It's only the love for Jesus. And it comes back to this again, that keeps you going. You know, Mary and Martha both saw the same thing in Jesus. I think we make a mistake as preachers when we say that Mary saw something that Martha missed. No, Martha and Mary both saw the same thing. Jesus goes into their home. Martha is busy cooking and cleaning and preparing for Jesus. Mary just sits there relaxing with the Lord, fellowshipping with him. Martha gets flustered and upset. She says, Lord, aren't you going to tell Mary to help me? I mean, I'm doing all this work and she's just sitting there talking to you. And he says, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're so worried about all these little things. But Mary has found that one thing that truly matters, and it will never be taken away from her. What's the scripture telling us there? The scripture is telling us very clearly that Mary understood fellowship. Martha understood performance. And when you do it for Jesus and him alone, it's impossible to lose that fire. When you walk in that sacrifice, when you live in such a way that honors the Lord and only the Lord, and you're not looking for man's approval. You know, I, 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 I can be honest with you, that's still a point that I struggle with. Not that I'm afraid of people's opinions. I've, I've not been afraid of people's opinions for a long time. But the flesh will still try to pull you to please people. It will. You don't think it's tempting to throw up some clickbait here on the YouTube channel? get in on some of the talk of the modern day and see how many views we can get. Maybe put out a video on some of the political things going on. Maybe put out a video on some 
pop culture things? No. Can't do that. Why? It just pollutes what God is doing. Would we get more views? Sure. Now, if I was moved by views, then the moment there would be a dip in views, there goes my passion for the ministry. If I am motivated by subscribers, if we lost our YouTube channel, well, there goes my passion for the Lord. But our passion for ministry, our passions for the things of the Lord, should come from that secret place. I do it for one phrase and one phrase only. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the day I'm living toward. Take away the lights, take away the cameras, take away the stages, take away the crowds, take away the audience. It all fades. I'm living for that one day. You want to keep the fire burning, keep surrendering to the Lord himself. Keep giving him something to burn. Walk in obedience daily. Do it for your love for Jesus, and that fire will never go out. Keep him the center. Okay, Mr. Vargas. Oh, by the way, chat, you guys are doing an amazing job by keeping the comments coming in. What I need you to do is keep the comments coming, but at the same time, you guys are very close. There's 839 likes on this video. If we get to 1,000 likes before the end of the broadcast, I'm going to give away... Sorry, Britain. I don't mean to blur it. That's not the glory. That is the, uh, <laughs> that's the high gloss cover. Um, this is Carriers of the Glory in English and Carriers of the Glory now in Chinese. I'm going to sign these and give these away to someone who left a comment. So if you get it to 1,000 likes, that's going to trigger the giveaway, guys. And even if you don't read Chinese, you will have the first copy of the Chinese book signed. There, I've never signed any of these. I was practicing. I was trying to learn how to sign my name in Chinese. That didn't work out so well. It wouldn't have looked all that great had I tried. Um, but anyway, that's what we're doing, guys. So we're almost there. We got 851. You're not that far. Make sure you do that. So what the way it's going to work is we reach 1,000 likes. And then after we get to 1,000 likes, we're going to pick someone from the comment section. So keep the comments coming. Take a moment. Light up the comment section. Emojis, amens, whatever you want. Even if you don't like me, say you don't like me. Just put a comment. As long as you're commenting, it helps. Okay. Mr. Vargas, the next question comes from Susan. Welcome to Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. What is your question? Maybe she's speaking to us in the spirit. Who are we moving on to, Ruben? <laughs> Kate? No, no, no. Uh, no, no, oh, no, there I she is. Mean, I mean, I'm sorry about that. She Boy, made it. That was time. quick. Yeah, no, we, we almost, we, Ruben, 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 uh, Ruben's quick. He just kind of moves <laughs> on to the next one. So Susan, welcome. God bless you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is my first time on your program. Um, only got introduced to you all just about a week ago. Or that's, you know, going through YouTube and I come across you and listen to your program. I thought it was quite interesting. However, tonight, the first time live, uh, I want to ask two questions. One is about forgiveness, and okay. the second is about surrendering. Okay. What happened is, I know you, the Bible says to forgive 70 times 7, but when you're being hurt constantly, every day, you know, you're, you're going through this, and there are times when you feel, okay, I'm going to give up, and it just keeps coming back and coming back, and then you also say to surrender, but... Yes, if you are surrendering, but you still feel as though you have to get in there to fight for yourself. You know what I mean? You don't totally give up. You don't, yes, I trust God. Yes, I believe in God. But yet you believe that you have to get in there to fight the battle for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? So um, I, would, asking, I would, I would, I would, totally I would say, surrender? I would say don't go based off of feelings for sure. Um, you said something so key there. You said, I feel like I have to fight for myself. Now, if by fighting for yourself, you mean having self-respect, preserving your dignity and not allowing people to abuse you, then I agree with you. We shouldn't allow people to take our dignity and abuse us repeatedly. That's not what the scripture is talking about when it says to forgive 70 times seven. But if by fight for yourself, you mean that you want to hang on to these things, then of course, no, the, the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord is what the scripture says Surrendering is simple. Surrendering is not a feeling. Remember this. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. Surrender to the Holy Spirit is obedience to the Word of God and the voice of God. It's that simple. And when we choose to obey God, we walk in the freedom and the liberty that He has for us, even in, as it pertains to forgiveness. Yes, we should forgive 70 times 7. Yes, we should forgive as the memory 
comes up. And no, it's not ours to fight. We give it to the Lord. We may feel like we have to. This is where faith comes in. Trust and obey. The only way to be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. Okay, Mr. Vargas, who do we have? Kate. All right, Kate, you're up on Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. Welcome. Hi, David. Um, thank you for the teachings tonight. It really, really touched me. Um, my question is um, the bitterness thing that you were teaching about. It feels like you were talking about me because um, for the past, I'll say, almost six years now, that's the thing I've been going through with my, my mother and my family. So it's like, um, I would say even before I got married, sometime I will hide myself in my room, cry over certain things. But when I go and ask her exactly thing that I have done to wrong her, she said, I haven't done anything. But, see, um, but still, you c I can see that there's a war between me and her, which it wasn't like that. Mm. So since I have asked for forgiveness, even my uncles, my pastor, my pastors have come in, but still she has built that wall. You know, so what I've told myself now is just, you know, give it to God and just move on. Mm -hmm. with my life so with this how should i you know move on because once a while it keep on it will hit me mm -hmm. and then i'll sometimes grieve over it or you know have you know like um pain over it or you know so like sometimes i don't know what to do well that's a tough one because it, it can be very heartbreaking when we want to reconcile with someone, but they build up walls and don't want to reconcile with us. That's the frustration with relationships is that not everyone's always going to be on board with what you want to do in the relationship. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. I'll read it in the King James Version for you because I think it applies specifically to this instance. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. In other words, if it's possible... And as much as is in your control, live peacefully with all men. You know, there's been people who've held bitterness against me. And I work hard to try to regain that brother or that sister. I work hard to try to reconcile the relationship. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do. Maybe they don't like a stance that you took. Or maybe they don't like a direction that you're taking in life. And there's all sorts of different things that can cause bitterness. But what I've learned to do is my interactions with them say more about me than they do about them. So even if this person is being cold toward you, they're cutting you off, you have to let that person go. Because if you try to hang on to it as if it's something that you can control, you're going to lose yourself in the chaos of that disconnect. And if you try your best to hang on and control, it actually causes the opposite reaction. When you pull on people who don't wanna be close to you, it causes them to pull back. This is something that not a lot of people recognize about relationships. And sometimes the people who like to fix everything, we pull on people who don't want to be pulled on. And in our pooling, we're actually pushing them further away. And that need to control everything causes us to, as they pull away more, for us to pull them closer to us. And so as we pull harder, they pull harder. And it causes this effect to where they distance themselves more and more and more the more we try to pull on them. The best thing you can do when someone is willing to disconnect from you is to let them disconnect. Let them disconnect. You did what you had to do. You apologized. You forgave. You reconciled. Maybe you took them out for lunch. You bought them a gift. You did what you knew to do and nothing worked at that point. And again, I'm not speaking about marriage here. There are different dynamics for marriage. At that point, that's when it's time to say, hey, okay, I got I to gotta let this go for my own health, for my own sanity. I need to make sure that I am living, yes, according to the scripture. And as much as lieth in me, I'm working on that. But that's it. I can't go beyond what I can't control. I can't go beyond what lies with me. And so after it's done on my part, then I leave it in their hands and I leave it in God's hands. And that's hard to hear. I know, I know, I know that's so hard to hear. I know what it feels like 
to have people disconnect from you. You know, I had a friend disconnect from me because he changed his theology. And he went into kind of this, um, like, Calvinist, you know, that, that side of the fence. And I was willing to connect. I said, hey, I'll connect. I still love you. And eventually he turned on me telling me, well, no, you're a heretic. You're leading people to hell. You're this, this, and that. And disconnected from me. Now, I never spoke evil of this person. I didn't, I didn't um, you know, try to harm them in any way. And they likewise never tried to harm me, but they just were angry with me just for who I was and what I represented. But I said, I can't bend on this. I said, I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in laying hands on the sick. I believe in casting out devils. I believe the spiritual gifts are still active today. Can't convince me otherwise. It's in the word. Now, it wasn't until years later, like two years had gone by, that this friend finally looped back around, realizing they probably were a little too harsh as far as the doctrines go. Today, we're like this again. Very, very close. Now, he's very much in the Calvinist, well, no, I, I shouldn't even say Calvinist. It's probably the wrong term. He's in the, the, you know, the John MacArthur camp, and we love John MacArthur. I think he does great commentaries. So, you know, he's in that camp. I'm in this camp. And we're really close friends. Our families have dinner with one another. Our daughters play together. They, they come over often. We go over often. We're very, very close. Some of our closest friends in the world. Why? Because for a season, I just said, okay, if you have to disconnect, disconnect. And God brought it back full circle. Now, had I gone in there and been all bitter and started attacking him, and it would have, it would have never been reconciled. I would have sabotaged it. But I let go, prayed, and God brought it full circle. So stay encouraged. I don't think it's completely over, but there is a time to let go. Mr. Vargas, the next question. Gracie. Gracie? Yeah. The next question comes from Gracie. Gracie, welcome to Viral Revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. What is your question? They're there, well, well, let's give them a moment because the, sometimes it takes a while to load on Zoom. Button come across your screen. Gracie, we are calling unto you. And now you should probably move on. Who else do we have, Ruben? Tinsy. Tinsy. Tinsy Thomas? Correct. Tinsy Thomas, our good friend. Welcome, Tinsy. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for this session. I uh, Recently, the last Sunday itself, I took this particular unforgiveness thing with my Sunday school students, and I told them that I am also struggling with this daily because at times we are into situations with people who at times hurt us daily, even without knowing. Yeah, that happens all doing. the time, and, and they don't even realize that they're hurting us. So, so Tinsi, what would be your, your question in this area, your specific question? So, uh, in that way, I got the answer that I need to keep forgiving, like, for, forgiving the memory itself, I got that. That was a big revelation, but the question here is that I have wronged someone in a way which I can't talk to them openly about. I want their forgiveness. I feel that that is keep in the in my life still. That unforgiveness from like I need to ask for their forgiveness, but I don't know how to approach them because I can't literally say it to them. That now I have keep keep Tinsy uh, on because I got I got to ask Tinsy a question. And, and Tinsy, anytime I interrupt someone, guys, please realize I'm not trying to be rude. I just we have a system here. And Tinsy would have been muted had had I not had had, had I not interrupted. So Tinsy, let me let me ask you something. Just yes or no, are you still in relationship or connected in any way to this person? Yes. Are you experiencing negativity in your relationship or are you guys pretty close? We are pretty close. Is this person in a- does this person in any way hold any anything against you or are things good? Just belief-wise, we hold it's a different belief. They don't believe in that level of powerful uh, testimonies and healing and all. They don't believe in that. So other than a difference of doctrine, you guys are pretty good friends. Yeah, she is my sister. Okay, well then, I mean, if that's the case, you may be feeling a sense of misplaced guilt. Sometimes we work up things in our head and we go, there's been times where I've gone to apologize to people and they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, weren't you offended? They're like, no, I, I don't care. And it wasn't even an issue. So, you know, it's, um, it could be that. I, I would say just go talk. 
just sit him down, sit her down and say, hey, I want to talk to you. I feel like I hurt you. I want to apologize. Did this hurt you? You may be surprised and she may say, that never offended me or I didn't even think about that. And you'll be pleasantly surprised. So go and do that because your conscience is bugging you. I would go and talk to this person. Go talk to your sister, reconcile. And I really do believe that the Lord is going to do a work. Now, here's, a, here's what I want to say to those of you watching. You've heard the message today and we're still going to answer more questions. We're, we're not done yet. So, but I just want to pause for a moment and tell you this. You know, there are some phone calls you might have to make now, guys. Chat, I'm talking to you. Spirit family, I'm talking to you. After this broadcast, you may have to send a text or two. You may have to send an email, a Facebook. You may, you may have to go unblock some people from online. You may have to unblock some people on the phone. As much as is in your power. And you may go apologize and they not forgive you. They may, they may never apologize to you, but you should still forgive them. You may not get the response out of the people that you want, but that doesn't mean that you don't show that love. How you respond to them is what demonstrates your character. Don't worry about how people are going to respond to your apology or how people are going to respond to your request for an apology. Don't worry about that. You worry about how you're responding and the Lord will bless you for it. Okay, Ruben, we'll take another question now. Kathleen. Kathleen. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. What's your question, Kathleen? Thank you, um, thank you Brother David, for noticing. And, um, I was wondering if um, sometimes it's just not, it's difficult oftentimes to do my devotional and praying okay? because sometimes um, when I go to the Lord, it feels like it is an obligation and not like a love, something like that, Brother David. And, Sometimes um, if I don't do my devotional for an hour or so, so much like that is, is going to guilt trip me. And I have to skip my class. I have to skip my chores. I have to skip my works and not that and to spend time with the Lord with another hour and another so. And it, it's frustrating sometimes, Brother David. And um, how, how do you um, do devotion with um, love and zeal for the Lord, Brother David? Well, first of all, it always begins as a discipline. And it sounds to me, honestly, and, and forgive me if I'm making a huge assumption, but I can hear the worry and the strain in your voice. It sounds to me like you're overthinking this thing, like way too much. You know, when I spend time with my Jessica, I don't sit down with her and go, Jess, I'm going to sit with you for an hour and 20 minutes. And we're going to talk and we're going to discuss and then from there, we're going to go and we're going to, you know, go get ice cream. We're going to go walk down the park. I don't, I don't do that to her. When I spend time with Jess, I just spend time with Jess. I, we hang out. We have fun. She's not looking at her watch going, it better be at least two hours. No, we just, we spend the time together that we can. So I think part of the key to not looking at it like an obligation is to stop keeping track of the time. Stop keeping track of how many, you know, what percentage of my day was devoted and how much scripture did I read. Just make a connection with God. That's all it is. Daily contact is the key. And you can go from there. I'm going to read some of the comments here. Uh, Stephen Moctezuma says, almost there, guys. What are you talking Oh, you're talking about the, um, the, like the thousand bill. likes there. We're at Where 937 at? likes, which is amazing. 937 amazing, amazing. likes. You guys are awesome. Remember, you get to a thousand likes. And we are going to give away a couple of books here. Chinese version of Carriers of the Glory and Carriers of the Glory in English. Okay, I see uh, Carla Laskowski says, come on, we can do this. Rose Ann is putting, are those, are those, oh, those are flowers. I thought those were um, roses. Sharoon Patrick, oh, we are so close. And then Vanessa says, that's awesome. Uh, Sunshine says, 937 likes. You guys are commenting so fast. I don't even know if I could keep flying. up with this. They're flying in. I could see why you're having so much trouble there, Steve. Uh, so Ellen says, thank you. And fire and tears. And then I see someone putting a, squir a squirt gun and saying spiritual snipers. I don't know what that means, but it looks interesting. And then I see uh, Ellen, uh, tears and fire and hands and doves and tears and uh, my goodness, you guys are amazing. Okay, best advice to those Christians who are struggling with emotions, feelings in their walk with God. Don't go by feelings, go by faith. That would be my best advice. Uh, Carlos uh, repeated the question there. I see Rhea with those beautiful nine symbols of the Holy Spirit emojis. Uh, Solo, how do you know if you... 
Let me scroll back there. <laughs> so I can, I can, so I can do it here. Yeah, they're going in so fast. Uh, oh, how do you know if you're really praying in tongues? If you said it's mostly you, and do you have to be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? Um, that's several questions there. Let's start with how do you, and it's gone. But how do you know you're really praying in tongues? I'll answer that one. Um, it's by faith. You know by faith. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. When I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. And so that's a faith language. That's a language of the Holy Spirit. When I pray in tongues, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to say what he wants to say through my voice. Okay, Melvin, I do have a question, please, but they didn't leave it, so it's up, it's gone. Uh, Rhea Campos, 36 more. Uh, Enya, do you... Uh -huh. I'm going to catch her here, over here. So I, on, on this part, I can't change it or I can't hold it. But over here on my laptop, I can. Anya says, do you, have to be, do you have to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again? Okay, great question. The infilling of the Holy Spirit again and again. Think about the fact that the 72 disciples and the 12 disciples all had the Holy Spirit because they were casting out demons, preaching the gospel, and praying for the sick. Jesus breathes on these disciples in John chapter 20, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit. These same disciples have to wait until Acts chapter 2 to receive the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit. That same group of believers, Peter and John among them, also have to wait until Acts chapter 4 to receive the Holy Spirit again. And it says, after the Holy Spirit came upon them, they started preaching with boldness, when they were already preaching with boldness. This is the many infillings of the Holy Spirit. Not that you can receive the Holy Spirit more than once, because the scripture makes it clear, especially in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that you can't be a child of God without the Holy Spirit. Ephesians makes it clear also that he's the seal of salvation. So therefore, when you are saved, you receive the person of the Holy Spirit. But there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit externally. What do I mean by that? John 7, 38, Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water, meaning the baptism with the Holy Spirit isn't rain from above. Rather, it's a flood from within. So the receiving of the Holy Spirit or the receiving of the baptism with the Holy Spirit isn't the receiving of the Holy Spirit. It's the releasing of the Holy Spirit. I receive them at salvation. I release them when I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that influence ebbs and flows. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave me, but his influence over my life can become stronger or weaker depending upon how I'm living and responding to his voice in the word. Now, Ephesians 5.18 says, be not drunk with wine. Instead, meaning this is my choice, this is a command, this is something I choose to do, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That phrase in Ephesians 5.18, be filled literally means to continually be filled, not like water in a cup, but like wind in a sail. Therefore, I continually allow the Holy Spirit to have influence over my life, not to receive him again and again, but to release him to have influence into the different areas of my life again and again. Britton, I think that would actually be a great highlight answering that question. That was very short and succinct. So let's get that going. 974 on the likes. You guys are awesome. Uh, Carla Laskowski, let's keep swimming. Let's keep swimming. That's interesting. And then um, we, we see, have, I have a question. Can I have the Holy Spirit book? Sure. Amazon.com. And then I, see, <laughs> then I see, let me see here. We got um, Kathleen K with the doves. And then uh, let me see, Gloria Chiang. Um, uh, Ruben, do we have one actually? For, this is too fast. I can't even keep up with the chat. This is amazing. Um, can we? Do we have anyone from Zoom? Yeah, Angela. Angela, welcome to Viral Revival. We're going to ask you to unmute. Please ask your question. Hi, Brother David. I'm from the Philippines. Well, God bless and you. And I would like to ask. Oh, God bless you more too. And I just really want to thank you and your ministry because it's just such been a big help. Praise like God. I've really grown. Um, since I started um, watching your videos and the Holy Spirit has even been more um, like really, I've been really been more sensitive and I'm closer to the Holy Spirit. And I just really want to ask about the spiritual realm. I've really seen some stuff, especially with my mind's eye, um, like about snakes and here at home, I just like really see stuff on the corners of the house and just like, it's trying to get to me and to our family. And I couldn't move when I sleep at night. Are you talking we about have, sleep like, paralysis? Yeah, kind of like that. So are, are you familiar with the term sleep paralysis? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. So, but like, it's kind of. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It's kind of what? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like bothering me at times. But what I think about sleep paralysis is just you can't, like, you can't um, move. But what experiences I see stuff while while that happens, and I try to um, say Jesus' name, but I can't, like, I can't pronounce it. You know, it's interesting to me that when I, 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 cause I teach this in my, my spiritual warfare seminars that demonic beings cannot physically attack the believer save through vicarious means such as sickness or the demonized uh, individual who might go in and say harm someone. So demons can't affect the believer physically except vicariously, meaning through other means secondhand like sickness, which is a reality in our world already and through someone who is demonized. So if somebody goes in, like for example, at Columbine, there was a godly young woman who was killed in that attack. Obviously she was harmed physically, but that was vicariously through the shooters at Columbine. Now, as it pertains to sleep paralysis, I find it interesting that the only example that anyone can ever give of a Christian being assaulted physically is pretty much described in the exact same way every single time. So what a lot of people don't know is that your body actually paralyzes itself every single night when you go to sleep. And so sleep paralysis or the experience of sleep paralysis happens when we become conscious before that paralysis has worn off. Now, in those moments, we become frightened, we become worried, and we may start to project onto the room what we think it is. So people who think it's aliens see aliens. People who think, think it's demons see demons. People who think it's a snake demon see snake demons, and so forth and so on. But we're always going to project with our mind's eye onto that reality when we're half asleep, half awake, and paralyzed in the physical body. So this may be demonic influence that you're seeing. So let's be clear there. This could be demonic influence that you see. But that doesn't mean that it's a demon holding you down. And I want to make that clear distinction. In fact, not only can you not say Jesus when you're experiencing sleep paralysis, you can't say anything when you're experiencing sleep paralysis. The way you get out of sleep paralysis, at least in the practical sense, is to be conscious of your breathing. Why? Because your breathing is both conscious and subconscious. Your body breathes while you're asleep subconsciously, and you can also at any point take over your breath and breathe consciously. So it's voluntary and involuntary. That's the function of breathing. It's both. Now, when you're experiencing sleep paralysis, the moment you go from involuntary breathing to voluntary breathing, meaning you control it, your body triggers that signal that tells you I'm awake. And so you come out of the sleep paralysis. It works every time, at least for me. Now, if you're experiencing demonic visions while you're experiencing sleep paralysis, again, let me emphasize, it's not that the demon is physically holding you down and the only word you can't say is Jesus. Rather, it's that you are experiencing a physical thing called sleep paralysis, while at the same time possibly seeing into the demonic realm because you're half asleep, half awake, but it can't touch you physically. Demons can't harm you physically. So you're not possessed, you're not oppressed, you're not cursed, but perhaps in that dream wake state, you are seeing some influence there. The way you get rid of demonic influence is very, very simple. You establish the influence of the Holy Spirit in that home through prayer and through worship, and you have ultimate authority. It's not even a fight for the Holy Spirit. Like sandcastles dissolving under the influence of a mighty ocean wave, so demonic darkness dissolves under the light of the Holy Spirit. And that's another one uh, there, Britt. Okay, um, 996 likes. I'm going to end it right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, right when it goes to 996. I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that to you guys. In fact, I've been kind of extending it, hoping to give you guys a better chance here. 995. Someone took a like away. Was it something I said? <laughs> oh, it's back. Okay. Or maybe they were mad about the sleep paralysis thing. They're like, I don't believe that. And they, they left it. Okay, so I'm seeing the comments coming. <laughs> Let me see. So the comments are coming in like crazy. We're, you're at nine. You did it, chat. You hit a thousand likes. That's incredible. Look at for every one thousand people who support us, there's two who don't like us. There are more for us than there are are against us. Those two people who disliked it are full of bitterness. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, they need to hear the message again. 
Well, congrats, everybody. You guys did it. I only I only held out for about <laughs> only been talking for three hours. <laughs> to be honest, I wanted to give this away, so I figured we would. Maybe next time I'll go for five hundred. <laughs> 500 go for half no we'll do a thousand every time that'll be the goal each time hey don't forget guys um subscribe if you're watching us on youtube uh, make sure you're subscribed we get a lot of great content thanks to jv lanuza for becoming a monthly partner thank you to so kim who gave a one-time gift thank you to brian or brian b-r-a-y-a-n interesting brian vasquez who gave a generous one-time gift. We so appreciate you. I think someone up there in the super chat. Um, the are yeah, uh, Paulini fan um, gave a super chat. Uh, someone said, I was, I was scammed by a con man out of tens of thousands of dollars. I struggled to forgive, but the harsh reality of my financial woe is still a reality. What should I do? Oof, that is tough. I had a friend who was scammed out of like $600,000. He, he, it was tough on him, yeah. Uh, that's not easy. I'm going to tell you that right now. That is not an easy thing to deal with, uh, Paulini fan. But what you can rest in knowing is that God will vindicate you and that he will provide. That's all I can tell you on that. And I'm sorry to hear about that situation. I see so many comments coming. Guys, let's just spam the chat. Let's spam the chat in celebration. I want to see emojis. I want to see symbols of the Holy Spirit. I want to see your location. I want to see whatever you got. Let's just go crazy on this. And don't forget to share this live stream, everybody. Uh, this is the Spirit family. Look at the Spirit family. Go. Look at you guys. Uh, you, you guys Flying. amaze me. You amaze me every single time. And this is why I love, love, love gathering with you. Don't forget, every single Wednesday night, we are gathering together in spirit, spirit family. Subscribe, subscri subscribe, subscribe. There's a tongue twister. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> do it right now. Click the notification bell when you do. We love you all. I think that's going to do it for this edition of Viral Revival. Keep the comments coming because that's how you're going to win. Ruben, um, why don't you go on over to the, the chat over there on Encounter TV. Um, Go ahead, everybody. Ruben's going to pick it now. I'm going to wait another minute or so. Um, hurry, Ruben guys, is going to pick the winner within the next two minutes. So chat, 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 chat. Spam the comments. And the more comments you put, the more likely you are to get picked by Mr. Ruben Vargas. Steve, anything you want to say before we pick a winner? I just want to say, guys, it's been such an honor and a pleasure to be with you here in the chat and as well as the live stream. It was a lot of fun today. My goodness, I could not even keep up with all of your comments and all of your uh, just interesting little emojis. We love it here. We appreciate you guys so, so much. And always remember, we love you so much. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Vargas. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, Ruben just text me the winner. Okay, now keep in mind, let me say this before I, I say the winner, because you have to be watching when we announce you. If this person doesn't claim it right now, we're going to pick a different winner. So the winner of both books, both Carriers Drum of the roll. Glory, <laughs> in its high gloss, don't worry, Britt, it's, it's okay, in its high gloss format, this is the one right here. That's the big one. The, the big Chinese ticket. version of Carriers of the Glory. Wow. Now, again, I'm going to sign this one. It'll be the first signed copy wow, wow, wow. of Carriers of the Glory ever. I'm having trouble with my monitor. I never really know which way to turn the book. The signed copy of the Chinese version of Carriers of the Glory. And the book winner is, the book winner for this edition of Viral Revival. And I think we should do this more often, too. Yeah, I think yeah. that'll be the goal. Every time we hit 1,000 likes before the end of the stream... We'll go ahead and do that. The winner of Carriers of the Glory in English version and Chinese, signed, sent to you, shipping and handling covered, absolutely free. The winner is someone who is watching right now, <laughs> someone who is commenting, drum roll, someone who wants the books. Their initials are... <laughs> <laughs> their initials are jp 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 so jp first name with a j oh wow. last name is with the p interesting i i, I think i i think uh, i should say that and the the winner now no you I, think i you know what i think so i think i should say the winner now Why jessica not? and i didn't pick you because you have my wife's name remember it's it's ruben that picked <laughs> Jessica La Pena 
is Whoa. the winner. Jessica La Pena. Awesome. You won Carriers of the Glory, English and Chinese. Wow. Jessica La Pena. I see the comments right there. Jessica La Pena, you are the winner. And I see that she's watching right this moment when I'm announcing it. And you will be sent the Chinese version of Carriers of the Glory. I'm going to put this little thing back on. I'm going to sign it live right here on the set. So as I sign it, I'm going to write in the book. Here we go. Jessica La Pena. I'm writing to Jessica. And can we congratulate her in the chat here? This is the first signed copy of the Chinese version of this book. Thanks for your support. And then I'll sign it. And there it is right there. I feel like when, when the president signs like something into <laughs> like a bill, I like show it to the different people. There you go. Awesome, awesome. To Jessica, this is the first signed copy of the Chinese version of this book. Thanks for your support. And we're gonna send that off to you, Jessica. Congratulations. Congratulations. Don't forget, guys, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Click the notification bell when you do. Make sure you're a part of these live streams every single Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Wasn't this awesome? We're going to do this again next week. Next week's going to be amazing, guys. I'm talking about spiritual warfare myths. Oh, it's going to stir up a lot of religious spirits. <laughs> we'll see you then. Until then, remember, nothing is impossible with God.